This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. So, uh, seeing the presence of a quorum, I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Regional School Committee on Tuesday, February 9th, uh, 2021 at 6.32 p.m. And we'll start with a roll call attendance. Uh, Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. Ms. Lord. Ms. Spitz. Seeger, Ms. Seeger. Seeger present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Uh, Ms. Stancer. Stancer present. McDonald present, and I'll uh, check one more time if, uh, Ms. Lord. Lord present. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, as we get started, we are being live streamed and recorded. Um, live stream, thank you to Amherst Media on um, Amherst Media's website, as well as on um, Channel 15 in Amherst. Um, and I also want to welcome um, uh, Ms. Gribko, our, our student representative. And we also have uh, Dr. Slaughter and Dr. Morris and Ms. Sharkis joining us this evening. Um, our first item is approving minutes. Um, the, we actually don't have any minutes to approve. Um, the minutes that were in our packet, we reviewed and approved at our last regional school committee meeting. Um, our next item is public comment. Um, and all of the public comment um, that we received today was re related to the budget hearing. So we'll um, come back to that when we get to the budget hearing item on our agenda. Um, and next up, we have committee announcements. Are there any announcements from any committee members? Mr. Harrington. Yeah, so it's posted on the, the ARPS website, but I, I just wanted to point out that there will be a JLMSC meeting on Friday and that the uh, topic of the discussion will be vaccinations and vaccination clinics and such. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Any other announcements from the committee? Seeing none, um, we'll move on um, to the superintendent's updates. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Morris. Sure. Uh, I, I always say I'm going to try to be brief today. I think I'll be actually successful. So i um, got seven points, but they're all pretty, pretty narrow. First is just a neat one. Um, I asked Katie Richardson, our ELL coordinator today, how many languages are spoken in the district? and um, Every time I've asked in the past, so I don't have a historical record that goes back 30 years, but um, it's usually like, you know, 38, 44, and this year we're at 50 languages spoken by students in our district. So, you know, I think that's actually notable. Um, it's a nice round number. It's the largest number I've ever heard, and I think it shows the linguistic uh, diversity of our students. And, you know, just kind of excited. It got me jazzed on a snowy day. Uh, it wasn't, you know, Super fun with jazzy stuff, but but you know, thanks for Ms. Richardson for finding that out, and I think it's just a good celebration. And sometimes there's ways to talk about diversity that are uh, less tangible, and you know, this is a really tangible way to talk about the linguistic diversity of our students and what they can offer and what they bring, and just what makes us all happy to be working here in this community. Um, so thanks, Katie, for finding that out. I want to share that. March 17th uh, is a curriculum day, and uh, just as a heads up, we shared this with staff today, um, or today or yesterday, but uh, the keynote is Kimmy Carlos, who is the founder of Urban Mental Health Alliance, advocating for healthy minds in urban communities, and all staff will be with her from 8 to 10 in the morning. Um, and, and then there's facilitated groups across the schools or discipline uh, focused on anti-racism and diversity and equity topics. Um, and again, just it's for all district staff, um, not just for teaching staff, because it's, just, you know, we really all means all and if we're going to move forward as an organization as we're doing then that that's what we all choose to do um or we all will be doing uh third thing congratulations to high school student helen dalton she was awarded the best in category award for editorial cartoon in massachusetts by the herb block foundation cartoon was completed as an assignment on black lives matter for her remote learning arts of comics class her work was judged to be the best in the state after receiving a gold key from the scholastic art and writing awards in addition to a $200 cash prize, the editorial cartoon would be advanced for national recognition 
as the Massachusetts entry in the National Herb Block Award. Uh, you know, just want to thank Ms. Dalton, her staff, her teachers, her parents, her family uh, for all the work, but particularly for her for being so creative. And if you haven't seen it, it's on our social media networks and our website. It's, you know, uh, very, very professional looking in my uh, lay opinion. Um, but it, it is not what I think I saw a lot when I was in high school. I'll put it that way. Uh, good news on the pool testing. You know, we are accepted in the state order. Our first order was sh uh, submitted today and it's being shipped to us and we'll be able to have a weekly testing. We have day days of the week and courier service worked out. So thanks to Faye Brady and Robin Supernot for working on the pool testing. Um, today was the final day for um, Doreen Cunningham and I. We, uh, through our MSAN network, uh, were involved in equity and leadership professional development by Dr. Darnisa Amante Jackson it was just fantastic and highly recommend her and just even I mentioned to the chair today you know we may reach out to her even just for some training for us you know uh, folks who attend school committee meetings because we found her her ability to talk about DEI topics diversity equity inclusion topics and and leadership and and really how they connect I think would be both Doreen and I were pretty blown away and we wanted to perhaps figure out a way to share it with the school committee so more on that soon but uh, you know, it, it was really outstanding for, for Ms. Cunningham and myself. Second to last, um, our distance learning center at the high school remains open, but um, the Amherst Recreation Distance Learning Center will have to close for the next few days as many of their staff are UMass students. Uh, as you may know, uh, UMass um, students are on some level of quarantine-ish. Uh, I don't have the right language in front of me, but they're, they're not uh, supposed to leave where they're living unless for certain reasons and one of the reasons does not um, work with children so um, that that program will be closed and hopefully will open up after the break and, you know break starts next week so for the next three days anyway that'll be closed there was one student teacher working in our distance learning center at the high school and and similarly that student teacher won't be coming in in person for the next couple of days. Uh, I want to thank the um, town of Amherst, who's been really fabulous at communicating with the school district about this. Um, you know, particularly Paul Bachelman has been giving me multiple updates um, throughout the weekend and at the beginning of this week, and that's been really helpful. So, you know, thanks to Paul and thanks to the town. And my last one is just, uh, I know we'll have this in the agenda next week, but for um, late start time, uh, had some really good sessions. I've been at four of the seven schools, I think, five of the seven schools, something like that. Um, so having great conversations with staff, I was able to, thanks to CPAC, um, attend a CPAC meeting and talk about uh, start time topics with that group, uh, with the PGO leadership across the district. Also a really helpful conversation tonight, unfortunately for me, is the BPAC meeting. So Katie and I think Tim Sheehan are going to cover that and get feedback from uh, that focus group, we have over 1,600 responses uh, on the survey. Um, and I also want to thank Dr. Marta Guevara because she um, and the Family Center staff organized um, individual conversations with uh, families they work um, a, a high amount with, you know, and we, I have a, a really nice write-up uh, for me of the feedback we received from those families. So we're getting feedback from all corners, which is what the goal was. Um, and we'll have more on that. The survey closes, I think, tomorrow. Uh, I believe it's tomorrow. Um, and so, uh, you know, in the next couple of meetings, I'll be sharing that feedback um, with you. And that is actually a relatively brief update tonight. So we'll see if there's questions, but uh, at least the first part of it was brief. <laughs> that was, I, I think that's a record, actually. <laughs> a nice job. <laughs> um, <laughs> any uh, comments or questions from any folks on the committees? Um, Ms. Kenny and then Ms. Seeger. Um, I just wanted to second your thinking of that 50 languages spoken in our district is awesome. I think that says great things about who we are as a community and how we value diversity. And I am really excited about that. I wish I knew more languages. <laughs> Ms. Seeger. Yeah, I, I want to comment on that, too. One of the things I was wondering, um, I, I've worked in academic libraries for a few years now, and we often catalog the languages that staff speak. Have you done that? And I'm curious if you have, like, how many languages does that represent? Yeah, so, you know, I think by staff, I'd be thinking about non 
translators, tutors, you know, um, in other words, people whose job isn't exclusively to support students who are acquiring uh, English. Uh, we haven't done that. That's a really good idea. I'll bring back to Ms. Richardson. Um, I, I, it's definitely less than 50. Um, you know, I think one of the one of the, the wonderful parts and the challenges that Ms. Richardson, the department works so hard at is if you're talking about 50 languages, it means you've got some relatively low incidence languages in there. Right. So not Spanish. I mean, our, our Spanish is our largest non-English first language. Um, and then you've got Chinese, Korean, Portuguese and Creole, you know, being connected. Um, and then, you know, because I've seen this, I haven't seen it this year, but last year, Ms. Richardson put it together with me. And it's fascinating when you see not just the list of languages, but the incidents uh, among, you know, what percentage of the ELL, of our ELL students speak Spanish as their first language, what percentage. Um, and, and so you get to the bottom of, of 50 languages and, you know, and we're in Western Massachusetts, we're not in an urban center. Uh, and, you know, that that's that's the wonderful challenge that we have is how to support students linguistically, uh, given their language, uh, the you know, variety of language backgrounds. But that's a great idea. So thank you for that, Bethany. Mr. Demling. You teed me up perfectly, Dr. Morris. So I was going to ask you about that. So I, I would imagine that the services we provide and, and how we engage to support students when they come into our district with a low incident language um, is going to be a little different than if they come in with a, a language with higher, higher incidence. And yet, you know, every student matters. We want to, you know, meet their needs as much as any other student, regardless of how small the subset of the population is. So how, um, like, what does that look, you don't have to go through everything, but like, what does that look like? You're a family and you speak a, a rare language and your student comes in and we want to meet their needs. Like, what do we, what, what does our engagement process look like? What kind of support do they have? Yeah. So one of the things is trying to match translators or tutors, uh, particularly with the low incidence languages, where to Ms. Seeger's point, we don't have staff necessarily who are able to speak that. And, and in Massachusetts, you know, the primary language of instruction by law is intended to be English for the most part, with this, some some other exceptions. Um, so a lot of it's not just linguistically, a lot of it, and our staff is fabulous at this, is learning about the cultures, the traditions. So even if there's not the ability to communicate in students' home language, uh, some of it's not just about oral communication. Some of it's about what's the comfort level? How do we as adults who may not be experienced with, um, separate from linguistically, the cultural um, benefits and advantages that students come in with wherever they're from in the world? And how do we provide an, uh, a safe, comforting environment for students who may not be yet be able to speak uh, or knowledgeable to English, and we may not have the staff to speak a little incidence language? So it's a lot of research. It's a lot of homework for our staff, and they do it uh, you know, incredibly well. Any other questions or comments or ads? Ms. Spitzer. Um, just a comment about the survey about um, changing the start time. And I was wondering if there's any um, plan to maybe just resend it to remind families that um, the deadline's approaching just because we are, it sounds like you're getting a great response for you, but it would be great to just send a reminder out. Yep, yep, no, we usually have that out on the, like Debbie sets it up so it forward dates it so it always goes out on the last day of the survey. So I imagine she has that, I'll confirm that. Any other questions? Not seeing any. Last chance. Okay. Um, and um, according to our, uh, oh, no, so next is uh, uh, my update, Chair's update. Um, and I, d I do have just one brief update. Tonight seems to be, the theme is brevity. Um, on Thursday evening, um, the Amherst School Committee hosted a public meeting um uh with with um residents it was uh pursuant to the a, a petition that was filed under the amherst town charter um that was a robust discussion um i think at one point we had a, close to 170 attendees um and uh lots and lots of comment and questions that recording is available thanks to amherst media for um uh, streaming and recording that for us it is available on the amherst media youtube channel for any um anybody who would like to view the comments that we received from the amherst um, uh, resident meeting i'm now going to move on oh sorry there were also questions that um we may not have gotten to and we will be um, uh, grabbing those questions from the question file from the Zoom meeting and um, providing responses to those that we didn't get to during the meeting. Um, Dr. Morris. 
I just wanted to note because uh, because I think you're right. It was well attended, and there was 100, you know, 60 what some odd people on there. But I think uh, you know, someone gave me feedback that a lot of people also were watching on the live stream. Mm. Um, so you know, I think there were a lot more than that number of people who were Channel 15. I think that's what I heard a lot of. So I think um, there may have been even more people attending that weren't interested in. Uh, having their name on, like, you know, being a quote unquote Zoom attendee, but they were definitely watching it. So, you yeah. know, um, just want to to note that, you know, I think people who got the word out about the meeting were successful in, in having a, a widely attended meeting, you know, and I think in these virtual meetings, it's, you can attend multiple ways. So it's really hard to get to the bottom of exactly how many people are, are looking. But, you know, just the feedback I heard just anecdotally was, it was even, it was quite a bit more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me that. Um... Yeah, so um, for folks that um, weren't able to attend or, um, uh, or or had trouble attending the entire thing, it is available um, uh, for viewing. Um, and so uh, now our next item is uh, again school committee announcements. So if there were if we if there are any additional comments or announcements that um, school committee members have, uh, that's and I'm not seeing any. So uh, we will move on, and we are making uh, record time. Um, primarily because we moved the public comment um, to the budget hearing. So our new uh, and continuing business is um, is our budget hearing. And sort of before we go in there, I do want to sort of tee this up a little bit. Um, this, uh, sorry, um, rearranging my screen. Um, so tonight's uh, budget discussion is a budget discussion and a hearing. Um, and for folks that are, are just tuning in, this is the first real opportunity that the regional school committee has had to discuss the proposed budget for fiscal year 22 and to provide feedback to the superintendent on the proposed cuts. Um, so as a little bit of background, we met first in early December with the four member towns at a four, four town meeting on a Saturday morning. And that was an early look at possible total funding and cuts at that time. At that time, we were looking at a potential total of $1.4 to $1.7 million in cuts to current services, or otherwise known as level services, in order to meet the guidance that we had received from some of our member towns for level funding or zero increases in spending. Soon after that meeting, the Regional School Committee met and approved a motion that committed the district to working with member towns to find a way to cut less than a million dollars to level services. And I emphasize that less than a million dollars because there's been reporting in the press that um, that I think has led to some misunderstandings of what the school committee um, decided or, or voted on at that time. So developing and improving a budget for a regional school district is an often complex process that requires collaboration and sometimes compromise between the district and the independent towns, each of which faces its own fiscal constraints and challenges. So the current proposed budget that was first shared on Friday in advance of Saturday's four town meetings represents an attempt to balance the school committee commitment to more than to no more than a million dollars in cuts with the fiscal requests from our member towns. Tonight we'll be spending more time reviewing this proposal as well as discussing and providing feedback on the proposed cuts and we'll be hearing from the community in the budget hearing. And lastly, given the complexities and challenges with this particular budget, I will be proposing when we get to future agenda planning that we schedule a second budget hearing for early March so that the public has more opportunity to understand the proposed funding and cuts to services and to weigh in once more before the committee votes on the budget. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter for the presentation. Sure. Um, I just wanted to check. I'm fine either way. Were you planning to share the comments now or after the presentation? Oh, um, I had thought after the presentation, Great. but I'm going to do that now. Oh, no, no, no. I just wanted to make sure it was consistent yeah. with what you, you know, there's a lot going right. on. I want to make sure it wasn't a forgotten thing, but if that, that's totally comfortable with me, you know, and that's yeah, what so we for, typically do. <laughs> for folks watching at home, um, normally when we have a budget hearing, we invite the public to comment what we are, um, we've used the same um, typical public comment uh, procedure that we've been using for regular public comment. So we have, we do have email comment as well as one voice comment um, that we will share after the presentation. Um, and for folks that want to read ahead, the, um, the, pub, the 
comment document is already posted on the regional school committee agendas page. So now I'll turn it back over to you. Perfect. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, describe a little bit about this, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Doug. So um, I want to go backwards and then forwards. So going back, we start the budget process generally in October. You know, we get some very, very early projections um, and start meeting with principals and directors. Um, as I describe, it's we try to gather some thoughts about ads cuts, but, you know, invariably the needs are there where mostly people will think of ads until they are forced to look at budget reality because there's no shortage of things that people would creative ideas to support students. Um, as the numbers have gotten you know, uh, more known, we had a four town meeting in December and I think it was December 5th, if I remember correctly. Uh, and at that point we, we had a lot of variables out there, but we described, you know, that there was perhaps somewhere in the area of 1.5 ish million dollars of cuts that, that were, um, at least going to be considered. And then we talked with the four member towns, uh, Amherst, Leverett, Pelham, and Shootsbury, uh, about that situation, about assessment methods, um, as, as Ms. McDonald said, the school committee passed the motion of limiting the cuts to not more than a million dollars, not at all that you were asking for a million dollars of cuts. It was about limiting the potential impact to our programs. And so um, tonight we're at a budget hearing. And what that means is that we'll be sharing more specifics, particularly uh, the particular focus of them. Um, will be both the ads cuts list, the reasons why we're at a million dollars, but also the assessment methods. I think it's important to note that we had a four town meeting on Saturday uh, as well. And at that four town meeting, we received feedback from our member towns. And, and I think I'm gonna cue this up a little bit, although Doug will go into it later, certainly when we get to the uh, slide with the assessment methods. Uh, we left the meeting without consensus from the four towns uh, about an assessment method. And the, for us that works in regional schools, that means we left without consensus on a budget. And so that's the situation we find ourselves in. I say that at the beginning, because I think it actually offers a context of everything else we're going to say tonight. Uh, the last thing I'll say before we get into the details, and Doug, you can certainly queue up the slides if you'd like, is we met with um, Doug, uh, hung out in the middle school room, which I got to the, to the end. And then um, I was with uh, Talib and Dave at the high school in Summit Academy. So the ads cuts list was shared with staff on Friday afternoon before it became a public document. Um, uh, and any individual staff members whose role in the district might be at risk was spoken to individually before that meeting uh, on Friday afternoon, knowing that things can change and we're really clear about that, but we really value that staff are able to see documents like this that affect them so much um, before it becomes a public discussion point. Uh, as Ms. McDowell noted, this was prepared in the same slides from, from Saturday, um, but there wasn't discussion on the ads cuts, particularly because that wasn't really the purpose of the four town meeting. But uh, the members, the elected officials beyond the school committee in the four towns asked to see what potential cuts would look like. So at the prior town meet, four town meeting, so we brought that forward. All that ado, I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to Dr. Slaughter. He's going to roll through some slides. Uh, again, for those of you who watched the four town meeting in the public, this is going to be, there's no changes from that. Uh, I will be talking about the ads cuts and really it's just cuts this year uh, in much more detail uh, given the different context of tonight's meeting. Uh, but the actual slides uh, are, are identical to what was shared on Saturday. But I'll turn it over to Dr. Slaughter. Great. Thank you. Um, can everyone see the, the presentation slide fairly fairly well? Okay, that's good to hear. Uh, if you see me staring up in the, like I'm staring at the ceiling, it's just because my monitor is above my camera, and so that's why. Um, so again, we're using the same slide deck as we used on Saturday. Uh, I will try to be uh, quick but not rush, to, to borrow a phrase from uh, John Wooden, the basketball coach. Uh, so I'll try not to belabor points that are uh, familiar to you all and, and yet still be clear about it for those that haven't seen this before. Um, so uh, this was our agenda on Saturday, but it also uh, lays out the order in which we'll take things through. Uh, I'll talk about our revenue sources other than uh, that we have coming to us separate from the assessment uh, and the changes since December, the expense projections we have, uh, and, the note, and note those things that are, are more solidly known since our, our conversation in December and therefore uh, was part of, of, of uh, Saturday's discussion. I'll get into the assessment methods to some extent. Um, and then at the very end, we can talk about capital as well, and, and maybe we'll have an opportunity to talk about that in a little more detail. Um, before we get into the assessment methods is when, when uh, Dr. Morris will go into more detail about the, the cuts we're going to need in order to uh, 
to uh, put our budget together and, and meet the meet the needs of our four communities. So starting with revenue, uh, just as a reminder, the color coding that we use, green for favorable, uh, yellow for neutral, and red for unfavorable, um, as far as a general sense of how those different areas are, are uh, playing out in this year's budget. Um, so since we met in December of Chapter 70, we got a much better sense of that. The governor released his budget on, on this, uh, January 27th. Uh, and you know there was not a tremendous increase, but yet a little bit of an increase, which is always positive news. We included that in, in this uh, presentation. Um, regional transportation aid, we, we uh, are able by being a regional school district to uh, ask, the dis uh, ask the state for some reimbursement for our travel as we go and pick up kids in a, in a bro broader geographic area. Um, unfortunately, that uh, projection from the, from the governor's budget is, is a decrease, and so uh, we went back and, and refined our number for what we're projecting in, in reimbursement to our uh, transportation expenses. Uh, so that's going to actually uh, negatively impact our budget. Uh, our charter tuition reimbursement, we, we pay uh, charter tuition, and for new students who are going into charter schools uh, from our district, there is some support from the state to help ease our transition into paying that tuition. Uh, and so they give us a reimbursement. Uh, the uh, the short story is is that the number of students we have out in in uh, in charter schools is is decreasing a little bit, so our reimbursement is going to go down. But simultaneously, our tuition is also going to go down. And so those kind of offset each other. Uh, so the amount that the charter tuition reimbursement is going down is about the same as as what the uh, tuition will drop as well. Um, e and D, which is is uh, excess and deficiency. Uh, if you're familiar with town uh, uh, finance, it's it's known as free cash. Uh, we have an upper limit on how much of that we can hold. Uh, if we go above that limit, we have to give the money back to the community so that they can use it for other purposes in their in their in their towns. Um, but given the the way the end of last year played out, it's it's looking as though the amount of of E and D we have available for use in the budget for the coming year will be a little less, and so we're we're staying with the number that, that I had project, projected in, in December, which is a $400,000 uh, support to the budget. Uh, that is uh, quite a bit less than what we've used in recent years. And then uh, another source of income we have is Medicaid. Uh, we perform services that are eligible for reimbursement uh, through Medicaid. Uh, and we're just not doing the same level of service we've done in the past. And again, we've reduced that number. It hasn't changed since our December projections. But nonetheless, it does uh, impact our, our ability to fund our schools. I'll move on to the expenses. Um, in our payroll accounts, uh, you know, payroll is about, you know, our staff and their benefits are about 80% of our budget. Um, I've got that as a sort of uh, not unfavorable, but not favorable. <laughs> uh, you know, we have expected uh, step increases and, and we've projected for a COLA. Uh, we, we do have uh, negotiations this year, and so we'll have those conversations with the union as, as we uh, progress through the spring. Uh, but we have put in a placeholder to to, identi to identify those steps and 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 cola uh, that we might negotiate, um, and so the, that that increase is included in in the expenses of of our budget. Um, regular education tuition. So our charter assessment, as I was mentioning before, is probably going to go down a little bit relative to to where we originally projected it to be. That's going to be offset with the the charter reimbursement. Uh, but our choice and vocational tuitions will probably be slightly higher next year. Uh, we're expecting about $35,000 more in expense in that area. Um, special education is in a, is in a uh, more positive uh, frame than, than the current year. It's, it's based on our student needs, and so as our population changes, so does our need for, for supports for special education. And so that's looking like it's going to be a little less than it has been in recent years. Uh, and then under risk and benefits, this is where our insurance is carried. It's where our, our pension obligations are carried. Pension obligations are fixed. Uh, our, our Obligations to Hampshire County for our, for our staff that pay into that retirement system have been identified and, and included in the budget. Likewise, uh, about a week ago, we got the firm numbers from our, our insurer as to what the increase for the coming year will be, and that was a 1.11% increase, um, and that has been included in this, in this budget as well. So I'll pause there in case anyone has any questions. I know that this group is pretty much all seen this, but I'll, I'll take a moment in case anyone wanted to ask any questions about those two sort of broad categories before we go into the next section. Any questions? 
Not seeing any. Okay. So I'll keep on moving on. So, so keep, oops, shot ahead too far. There you go. <clears throat> so a couple of key points. Number one uh, is that, and, and this played into Saturday's conversation a bit more for communities, but, but nonetheless, it's important for this group as well. And that is that the fiscal 21 budget only recently got adopted. And as a result, the actual, uh, you know, chapter 70 allocations, but more importantly for our purposes of planning is the minimum contributions, which are component in the, uh, what's called the uh, statutory method of assessment, uh, were only recently set. And so those, we had used what we had for best numbers in our previous calculations, but certainly with those most recently uh, finalized numbers, we were able to, to utilize those, those new numbers for, for minimum contribution. And that does change the balance of, of how much people pay, not 10 or 20%, but a small amount, but it does make a difference uh, as we play out those different assessment methods as to the burden that each town will bear. Um, I think two other points I'll talk about relative to uh, the current circumstances we're in and the coming circumstances we face is that there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. We had a tremendous drop in, in students. We had a little shy of a 5% drop in the number of students we've had uh, in our schools this year. Uh, statewide, uh, there's more than 30,000 students down in, in public schools in Massachusetts. Uh, as I was on a call recently, they said that's like 10 years worth of change in one year, uh, that typically only a few thousand move in or out of, of uh, public schools in Massachusetts. And this year, there's a very, very large drop. And no one's sure how many of those students will return next year as, as the circumstance around the pandemic play out and, and improve. And so I think with, with that uncertainty and how many uh, kids we will have, uh, it, it makes it difficult to plan. And especially when our budgets are as tight as they are, uh, it makes it difficult for us to, uh, to, to plan well and to absorb uh, changes that we need to, to factor in as, as we uh, understand what our enrollments are going to be uh, come fall. Um, the other thing is, you know, we, we followed the instruction that you all gave relative to, to, to a the sort of million dollar level of, of reductions and, and have applied that to this. And as a result, what we have uh, before you tonight is a, is a budget, uh, it's $32,009,777. And so that's the total amount of, of, uh, of budget for the, the coming year. And as we predict at this point, and, and that's the, the total uh, expense side of, of things. And uh, so I'll slide ahead to the next slide. And so I'll give a little bit of history here on, on what that means. And what that means is that our budget this year will actually, if we hold it 32 million and change, uh, will be slightly smaller than it was last year. And that budget was slightly smaller than the year before. Um, and so we, we see a, a, a couple of years in a row of you know, the sort of raw expense budget being less than uh, the previous year. And that has a, that has a distinct and, and, and a noticeable effect on our budget. And, and the kinds of things and programs we can offer. Um, and nonetheless, we also note on this slide is that we've had different assessment methods the last two years. As a matter of fact, uh, on a subsequent slide, you'll see that we've had different assessment methods over the last several years as we've had an ongoing and understandable uh, de debate amongst the communities as to how we fund and how each town uh, affords to fund our regional school district. And so uh, we'll continue to have those those conversations, and we'll hopefully be able to reach a uh, a reasonable compromise that that allows our schools to continue to function and perform the way we expect them to, and have the programming that we want to have. So this this slide takes us through. Um, Dr. Slaughter, I think sure. um, did Ms. Seeger, did you have a question? Sorry. Yeah, my question is actually on something two slides ago. Um, it, it's about the line that says the fact that we don't know maybe how many students are returning next year, the, the second bullet, the uncertainty in the enrollment for next year. Um, I understand how that affects Chapter 70. In fact, the, the reporting from October, how that plays forward into the next year. Could you talk a little bit about what, what will be affected? So if my understanding is correct, we, we did have a significant drop in students this year. Um, I don't recall hearing about a significant drop in staffing because of that. So what, what is it about, what could change next year um, with this? What, what does the uncertainty like look like if, if you're in the budget, if you're in the weeds of it? Where, where does the uncertainty play out? 
Well, I think there's a couple of things. Um, I think, you know, first and foremost is that if we have a number of students return, and I, I don't know that all of them will, but let's say we have a significant number of them return, you know, we're planning on a staffing level and class sizes, and, you know, uh, based on sort of what we have and what we anticipate will be in in, in, uh, in our buildings next year. And so, um, you know, as, as uh, if, if we get a significant increase, you know, it starts to make the, uh, the scheduling a much more difficult circumstance. And, and the, the, the difficulty that all schools are, are, are dealing with is the fact that almost everyone's enrollment, probably two thirds to more than two thirds of the school districts across the state have a much lower enrollment this fall that enrollment from October says chapter is part and parcel of the calculation for chapter 70. The state is anticipating uh, that there'll be many districts that will have, uh, you know, an uptick uh, in, in the fall. And hopefully, uh, you know, there'll be some supports for us if, if it is a, an, you know, an unusually large uptick in, in students. But I think the difficulty in, in some respects in, is that, uh, you know, if we have a certain plan of action in place and there's a significant change in the, that enrollment, uh, you know, the, the amount of uh, flexibility we'll have to adapt to that will be, uh, be somewhat limited because we'll just not have the financial resources to apply uh, in that circumstance. And so, um, and I think that the, the other thing, you know, as, as mentioned in the slide is, you know, there may be some students that want to stay remote. How much of that we can do? How much can we accommodate? in addition to in-person school uh, and how we accomplish that and how well we can accomplish that will all be factored, uh, factors in the, in, the, in the budget as we roll through the, the new year. Mr. Dunlin? It's a real quick comment to follow up on, on Doug's point is, you know, uh, uh, the other financial impact of unknown enrollment that I, that I think is challenging for us is that depending on where those students go, it could impact the budget differently this year or next year because some of this stuff lags, right? So if, if we have um, people who move away or they homeschool or they go to private schools, that's like medium level pain because we, we lose the chapter 70 funding and, and our ability to leverage the economy of scale is reduced. Um, if they go to school choice programs, then that's $5,000 a year that we pay out um, to any of our neighbors. And uh, yeah, as we all know, all, all of our neighbors have had more in person than we have had. So there's, there's that risk. Um, so it's like high pain. And then of course, the highest pain of all is the charter schools where uh, not only do we lose them, uh, chapter 70, all that, uh, but we, you know, um, it's, it's more than $20,000 a year every year uh, for these students. And so not not knowing where any of those buckets, buckets uh, will land um, with, with 10 times the volatility, as Doug mentioned, this year and, and next year, um, I think that that's, that's the thing. I, I, it's not really a question, but it's, it's really because that's the, where I f focus my, my financial anxiety on. Dr. Morris? Uh, and not to add to your financial anxiety, but um, I, I would say that a number of uh, superintendents uh, in local areas have contacted me in the last week, um, for whatever reason, the last week, to suggest to let me know that they're getting lots and lots of school choice calls from Amherst families, uh, which makes my financial anxiety go up as well. Um, so that's not hard data, like, I, but you know, these are people I talk to all the time, and they made a point, two of them made a point to call me directly and just be like, hey, just FYI. I'm getting lots and lots of school choice calls from from your community. So it is a point of concern. Um, you know, I, I did talk loosely to our administrative team that, you know, are we are we being conservative enough in our budget estimating because that that cost could add up significantly. So uh, I don't want to dwell on that point, but I just wanted to suggest um, that I think the anxiety you're feeling is certainly consistent with the anxiety we're feeling on that topic. I think we're good to move on. Okay, so uh, I'll bring this slide up again, which is a sort of historical, you know, and, and part of this slide was was for the purposes of the of the four towns meeting, just to uh, educate those that were new to the meeting, but also just to remind folks that have been to those meetings over several years the the sort of uh, history we've gone through and 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 the different methods we've applied over time uh, to try to find a compromise uh, in in. Uh, funding for each of the communities that, that sort of met some needs. Um, so just to, to orient you to this a little bit, uh, at the top is, is the actual operating budget that we had, and the very tip top of that talks about the different methods that we've used. Um, we mentioned statutory method. The, uh, the state offers uh, minimum contributions that we're required to meet. Um, 
and if we were to use a fully statutory method that the calculation changes every year we tend to use a five-year average uh, to sort of uh, mitigate the spikes that you might see within that in those numbers uh, which was the original idea we had with our our regional agreement method which is a five-year rolling average of of, uh, of student uh, of students and and when we do the five-year rolling average of students we're using all students that we're financially responsible for so what we have in that count and you see that at the bottom is all the students that are in charter and choice and vocational school are all included in that count uh, as far as uh, apportioning the the cost to, to each of the communities um, one thing also i will say is that any costs that are above the minimum contribution are still going to be apportioned by virtue of that regional agreement method so if if you know we have a, a roughly 32 million dollar budget if there's and I'm just going to use round numbers for the sake of, of explanation. If there's, um, you know, if the uh, if the minimum contributions add up for the four communities to be $12 million, the other 20 million uh, is is covered and assessed by uh, the regional agreement method. Um, and so when we use uh, percentages, we're using uh, a fraction of that minimum contribution method, and then the remainder is is applied. Uh, through the uh, the regional agreement method, so even even if we were to be in a circumstance with a hundred percent statutory method, we'd still be uh, utilizing that five year rolling average uh, as part and parcel of the calculation. Um, the other thing I'll point out on this slide is that at the very bottom, and you may not uh, be able to see it very well, but the very very bottom number is the DESI October enrollment numbers, which are used in Chapter seventy calculations, uh, and it's what is on the state website. So when people look up, oh well, how many students does Amherst Spelman have? Uh, you know, regional schools have, they'll see that sort of number. And the way to think about that number is that's, that's basically kids that are in the building. Um, and so what you see in looking at that compared to the number just above it, which is showing the, the five-year rolling average uh, of all students that we're responsible for is that while our, our enrollment, with the exception of this year, has stayed fairly flat, it's decreased a little bit, um, our overall enrollment, which includes all the charter and choice and, and, and vocational students, has decreased more significantly, more on the 2% per year range as opposed to the less than 1%, 1% range that we've typically declined. And so what that means is that we're retaining more students, fewer of making choices of charter and choice uh, as their options, uh, which helps our district on a, from a financial standpoint, but it also uh, helps us with a steady or more steady enrollment to, to maintain the programs uh, that we wanna offer in our, in our schools. Um, and so I'll slide on to the next slide. And so this is the the, uh, the various assessment methods that we had uh, put before the four towns on, on Saturday. Uh, the 45% statutory method, which is in the uh, beige column, which is the left, the first on the left in color. Um, that's the current method that we're using this year. Uh, we have a 55, 65, 75% uh, uh, use of the statutory method. And again, using a five-year average of those minimum contributions uh, then the modified 100% method, which we, and then uh, the the uh, the peach color, which is next to last on the right, is the is the purely statutory method um, as defined by the state. Uh, and then on the far right, in the green, is is our regional agreement method, which uses a uh, a five-year rolling average of the student population. Um, and so part of why we have those choices there is we you know we were looking to to meet the uh, the instruction from our member towns as to what they could afford uh, and what they could meet and, and sort of display the different uh, options available to them for for uh, the assessments that they they can uh, provide us and so uh, we we're hoping to have a consensus about one of those and we got a variety of opinions about those I I guess the best way to describe it um, so I think we're we're still uh, likely to be you know needing to have continuing conversations about what, what methodology we're going to use. Um, if we don't reach agreement, uh, we'll revert in the short term into the statutory method. Um, what happens, just to play that out a little bit, is that if we fail to have a budget in place by July 1, uh, the state puts us on a 112th budget. So they, they basically, uh, and, and they use the statutory method for the assessment of, of, of uh, to the towns. Um, and what they, really do is they give you about six months to get something figured out before they completely, you know, 
tell you how to live your life and 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 take full control of, of that uh, that budget for the year. But they give you a little bit of time as you go into the uh, into the new fiscal year, and they they basically uh, you know dictate the the terms uh, as it were uh, of of the budget as as we go through that. So it's a it's not. I mean, they do it. There are some school districts that have had struggles uh, uh, more severe, I think, quite frankly, than ours, and and and. Uh, so they they do uh, and are familiar with the process and and you know will will take us through but they definitely will be uh, exerting their pressure on us to get a budget figured out as soon as we can if we don't have one in place uh, at the end of June. Doug, if I could jump in, if it's okay with the chair, I just wanted mm -hmm. to I just wanted to clarify a couple things. Try to be very direct about this. Uh, the guidance we received from the staff in the town of Amherst was to not exceed a 1.5% increase in the assessment. The guidance we received from the town of Pelham was to maintain strong schools and work effectively with them, knowing that this year was gonna be a bump year for them. The guidance we received from the town of Leverett was to same as Amherst, um, not to exceed 1.5% increase in assessment. And the guidance we received from the town of Shutesbury was to make movement towards uh, the statutory method. Uh, so as a reminder on the slide before, Doug showed this year we're on the 30-45% method. We were at 30% the prior year. Um, so I know that got, um, I just want to be really clear about that. I think the other thing I want to be really clear about, and, and this is really the crux of the discussion, is that for towns who want to have the regional agreement method, that really equalizes the amount that each town, the, every town pays the same amount per pupil. Uh, the flip of that is that, and there's some there's a belief of fairness around that. The flip of that is the statutory method, which the state set up, takes into account a number of things that are intended to include the uh, the ability to pay, and so that doesn't equalize the per pupil expenses in that scenario. Uh, and I just want to make sure this is really clear because I think it wasn't clear, um, or there were comments uh, made by no one on this call that that didn't say this, but Leverett uh, in this situation would have the highest per pupil cost. Um, you know, and I think, you know, just things were reported in the paper. I want to be really clear that uh, Shootsbury is, is Amherst, Pelham and Leverett uh, all are pretty darn close in terms of per pupil cost in this. It's Shootsbury because of uh, a variety of financial factors that under the statutory method, um, their people will per pupil cost is lower than the other three towns by, by a more significant margin. Um, but I just wanted to clarify those points because I think they're, they're a little murky in the public and the more we can do to clarify them, I think the better off we all are. Um, I think at this point, I would suggest that we pause and see if there's questions for the committee. I know we have ad cuts to get to uh, as well as capital, but there's a lot here on this one. So I just figured um, with the chair's permission, if we pause here and open it up for, for dialogue, I don't know how you want to structure it, but we're, we're here to answer questions. If I could add one other thing before that starts, if I could. Um, if you were to take the regional agreement method and, and you know, divide the student population, you know, the sort of student headcount in, you know, five-year average into that, you won't get exactly the same. And the reason for that is that there are components of our operating budget that involve capital expense. And capital expense is apportioned to this in a slightly different way. There's a slightly different uh, uh, assessment method for that, so it shifts it a little bit. Uh, so if if we had no capital expense in our budget at all, then that uh, regional agreement method would have every single town's per pupil expenditure the same. But because we do have some capital expense, we buy some computers and things like that through our operating budget. Uh, it does apportion it, does shift it a little bit. So that's just a sort of artifact of the math that I wanted to make sure people were clear on. Um, so before we go to questions, I'll just uh, in terms of procedure for this evening is we'll we'll continue to focus on questions right now throughout this presentation, and then um, we'll pause and hear the public hearing comment um, at at that point, and then we can segue into each of um, the committee members' comments um, or further clarification questions at that point. So um, I saw a couple hands up for questions. I think Mr. Demley Seeger. And now I see Ms. Dancer, so we'll go in that order. Uh, yeah, so in the spirit of just questions and not comments, I'll hold on my comments. Um, so Dr. Morris or Dr. Slaughter, if you could summarize, if you recall, I mean, I wrote it down myself, but if you have it, then great. Um, at the end of the four towns meeting, um, there was a spokesperson for each town, and they indicated which of these assessment methods 
they preferred and which ones they would be willing to go to. Um, and the four towns obviously had different responses. And it's it's true that there was disagreement. And I don't know if, if you want to take a crack at um, summarizing what they said or whether that's too, <laughs> you feel too dangerous to, to quote people like that. Um, uh, but it, it's when we decide about what assessment method we want to uh, settle on uh, recommending uh, eventually, it, it's it's helpful information, I think. Doug, do you want me to take a take a no, shot at it? I was trying I don't to know I don't have a notes uh, here, but uh, what I recall, uh, I can do Pelham's really well. And so Margaret and Sarah Best, you can correct me, but uh, what we heard from Pelham is an interest in maintaining the strength of the region um, and some flexibility between the blue, you know, the beige, blue, terracotta, and perhaps even purple bands. Um, and then we went to the town of, uh, I think it was Leverett, and my understanding was Leverett was preferring to stay as close to 45% as possible. I'm looking at Ms. Seeger. Um, does that line up? I think maybe Ms. Seeger could jump in and describe that. That's okay. Yeah, that, that lines up with what, what I believe um, Julie said on Saturday. I just want to add to what you said that um, what I also heard was that Leverett would like to get back to the regional agreement. So going further to into the blue terracotta and purple is not in our best interest. Which yep. is what she said. Thank you. Yeah. I always love when people from the towns can summarize what the towns say, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I can then go to Shootsbury and uh, Mr. Sullivan, I think it's on the roads probably clearing them right now. So um, I think I'll, I'll have to describe Shootsbury. And um, what we heard from Shootsbury was um, an interest in going as quickly as possible uh, to the purple uh, and eventually to the modified statutory method um, based on their belief that the statutory method is to, uh, includes the ability to pay uh, and they believe that to be more fair. Um, and Mr. Demling, since you're from Amherst, I think I'll let you describe Amherst if that's okay. Um, uh, sure. I mean, yeah. so I'll note that this video is available. So if, you know, you don't have to rely on my paraphrase, but from what I recall, um, Amherst uh, expressed a a strong uh, preference for the 45, uh, and was uh, did not would prefer not to consider other options. Yeah, that's what I recalled as well. Okay. Um, Ms. Seeger, did you have a question? No, not anymore. Ms. Stancer. I believe um, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, my question goes back uh, to previous slide, Dr. Slaughter. When you said the state set the minimum contribution, you did. You said it changed a little bit, and maybe it doesn't really make much of an impact. But you didn't say whether it went up or down. So it it depended on which town you were in. Um, so for Pelham, so the minimum contribution, uh, it, I believe, for Amherst, it went up a little bit. Uh, for Pelham, it stayed the same. I want to say Leverett stayed the same. Shootsbury, I'm not recalling. It changed a little bit. But what that does is it changes the proportion that each town carries. And so Amherst actually carries a bit of bit bigger proportion now because that minimum contribution went up. Um, so the towns went down a bit. So it, it shifted costs in their direction a little bit. Um, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions at this point? Ms. Kenny. Um, so my question is actually just quickly. So the modified statutory method, is that another regional creation or is that the state? Like this, the statutory method is every year and then every year, depending on if a family moves into town or moves out of town, then it goes up and down every single year and the region came up with the five-year rolling average for that and then separately there's the regional agreement method that's correct i just want to make sure i'm understanding yeah. correctly in our regional agreement from i want to say the late 80s i was scanning through it but is is the five-year rolling average of, of students and and the purpose of that regional agreement method was again because a given school can have a a, 
a big uptick or downtick in, in the number of students, the five-year average tries to mitigate those spikes uh, from year to year. Um, the state's uh, statutory method is a single year, so each year minimum contributions are identified and then those are applied uh, in that year. Um, so basically, you know, when, when the budget gets set at the, uh, at the beginning of July, when the, uh, the minimum contributions are calculated for the, essentially for the coming year. Um, and that's what's interesting this year is because those didn't really get known until uh, a few weeks ago. And again, it can have, you know, significant spikes in, in, in uh, those minimum contributions as well. Uh, probably not quite as severe as can happen with student enrollment on a year-to-year -year basis, but nonetheless, still, uh, it can change by you know several percentage points. And so, using a five-year average helps to soften those those peaks and valleys a little bit. And so, that's again, yes, you're correct. The modified statutory method is is an invention of 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 uh, my predecessor and and several folks from the four towns that worked on this uh, over the, the recent past. Okay, so the. Regional agreement is a 40 year old, how we did it for a long time. It's the statutory method, I just want to make sure I'm understanding it mm -hmm. correctly. The statutory method is a Massachusetts thing that happens every year. So if a family of 10 moves into Pelham, big spike. If they move out, big spike down. And then the modified statutory method is a newer ARPS creation. That's right. And so okay. the, the other thing I would say about the statutory method is that um, it, it takes into account, you know, some factors that have to do with uh, the value of the properties in the community. So uh, and the wealth and the income of uh, not just individuals, but also businesses. So any income in the community is also factored in. So if you have uh, a number of people that move in with uh, fairly large salaries, they're fairly high income people that can shift your minimum contribution uh, as well. Or if you have, you know, a couple of new buildings go into your community that, that boosts up your your overall property values uh, significantly, uh, that also can can impact it as well. Um, so those are other factors that play into that statutory method. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dr. Morris. Before uh, before people make more comments, I also ju I just had a it's not a written statement or a prepared statement, but just a couple of things I want to say. So. Um, for those of you who haven't been on the committee that, that long or people who are watching in the public, this has been a constant challenge for before I was in this role. So this is my fifth year. Um, it's been a challenge before that. We've had multiple two or three working groups over that time period, paying consultants to come in, come up with, to Ms. Kenny's point, with different methods to um, try to work on this. And so this isn't a new problem. However, it it, it we keep on inching by year by year. We've had years where like two years ago in town meeting in Shutesbury, it was very narrowly, the budget very narrowly passed. And that was with the support of elected officials. Um, so, you know, I think one of the challenges long-term is that this is the second year in a row where under this budget, our budget's actually gone down. So we're slated to spend less money next year than we are spending this year. We're spending less money this year in our budget than we sent last year. And this isn't sustainable, right? And, and that's not anyone's fault. I'm not casting blame. I'm not interested in, in any of that. Uh, but as someone whose job it is to advocate for kids, uh, there aren't many districts around whose budgets in real dollars, not, in, not even talking about inflation, are literally going down. And so it's a real challenge for us. We're doing the best we can over the last couple of years. And I said this on Saturday, Last four years, we've averaged six hundred fifty thousand dollars of cuts to our level services budget every year for the last four years, um, and so I'm deeply concerned. Um, I, I was deeply concerned that we seem to not make progress with the four communities. If anything, I felt like we were in a less advantageous place at the end of the meeting than we were at the beginning. We'll do ads cuts after we have questions on this. The ads cuts because it's the four town meeting. I went through them rather briefly. I'll go through them in much more detail tonight. They are going to impact our operations. They are going to impact our district. And most importantly, they are going to impact kids, you know, our students. And so sometimes I can understand why that gets lost in a discussion that's complicated between regional districts, uh, in between towns and regional districts. Um, but I do want to, you know, share a, a mild amount of frustration, which I rarely do in these meetings, 
that year after year we're in the same discussion uh, about um, what method to use. We keep out coming up with, you can see, you know, this Dr. Slaughter's very creative chart of all the different options and, and the color coding is lovely at the bottom with the, you know, so we can all talk about the same things. Um, but even at the state level, they don't love that we're year to year have different, you know, they, they want us to have a consistent method. Uh, and we are an outlier for regional schools. Most regional districts more or less settle on a method. Uh, that's not where we are. So the stakes are really high when we're talking about impact on students. And it is challenging to think about the level of cuts having two years in a row with negative budgets, which is even in pandemic times, you look at other districts around, most districts are not facing this. Um, and, uh, and I'm not suggesting we're a poorly funded district. Certainly, you know, that's, that, that's not true, but it is when we have the, the things that people value on, um, on a table to be reduced, it, it makes it very challenging. And I worry about morale of staff. Uh, I worry about um, how students feel if they see, feel like every year it's being chipped away. And the explanation in some ways that our towns can't agree on assessment method is like wildly unsatisfying to the public. Right. And that's not a critique of the towns, but it, I have a hard time describing what Dr. Slaughter just described and we've been working on for the last half hour to the average person in the community. Um, and, and so that there is it's not just I mean, the ads cuts are where, you know, most of my attention goes. But um, this is a yearly ritual uh, as you've experienced it. And um, it, it, it takes a lot of attention and time away from our core work with kids. Um, and it's not that it's not worth the time and effort, but just we can bank on having a month or two each winter uh, where this is this is what we do. Um, and I don't have a solution how to get out of it. If I did, I would be, you know, there'd be more slides in the stack. Um, but I just did want to express from the staff point of view, the family point of view, and the student point of view, uh, what they're mostly concerned is what's going to happen to their programs, what courses are they going to be able to take, uh, and what supports can we provide from students? And and that sometimes gets lost when you look at even a very nicely color coded chart that Dr. Slaughter put together. Um, that th these have real implications uh, for the core mission of the district. So I'll get off uh, my you know soapbox here, but I did feel like that needed to be stated. Uh, I chose not to state that at the end of the four town meeting because I didn't think the meeting needed to end when it ended. Um, and um, but you know for the committee, um, I did feel like I needed to report back on the impact of this. Um, every single year. So I'll, I'll stop talking um, uh, about this, but I, I just, I couldn't, I can't not say the thing that is on when we met with staff on everyone's minds. I, had a, I will mention one more thing. So, you know, there was a question in one of the staff meetings I was in about the budget. Is this a one year problem that's only pandemic related or is this an ongoing challenge? And I was really honest about it. It's an ongoing challenge. Like I, someone asked, is it gonna be better next year? And I said, uh, you know, the pandemic, hopefully, yes, and that'll hopefully help finances. But the larger issue, um, I, I, the, I, there's no evidence that a year from now, we're not going to be having a similar conversation uh, with similar disagreements. Um, and it was deflating for staff to hear that, but I wasn't going to, you know, be dishonest uh, with staff about it. So um, I'll defer to the chair. I know that people probably want to jump in with their own comments, but I, I did feel a need to say that. Well, I, I think... What would be helpful to clarify is how much of this is due to disagreement on assessment methods and how much of it is um, driven by some other cuts. Like, I, I, because, you, you know, if everybody agreed that this would, you know, the assessment method aside, you know, I'm just looking at this chart. So if the 45% method is identical to what we had this year. So that would be sort of the the best case scenario that we don't have to renegotiate assessment method every single year. And yet the revenue fr not from, um, from the towns is, is declined by what over, you know, 300,000, $350,000 um, uh, flat on terms of chapter 70. So we'd even, even still, we'd probably, but I guess the question is, is like even in a, in a best case scenario where we have a fixed assessment method every single year, we'd s likely still be looking at significant cuts this year. Is that right. not correct? 
No, it is. So here, here's, uh, I'll try to be more uh, succinct about it, because um, I think I'm glad you asked that, because it's a really important point. So the challenge of regional districts in general, as compared to town departments, is that there is no good way to balance the, the assessments required that fits with, especially when you're talking about a four town region, uh, with four really different towns and one much larger than the other three with a very different commercial base and everything like that um, to balance it. So, you know, just compared to the Amherst public schools, we're not at that meeting, but I am going to just state that, um, that, you know, for them to get 1.5%, to, to get the same guidance from staff, we can guarantee that our budget can go up 1.5%, right? At a regional level, because you're balancing and there's a proportional equation, there's no good way to do that. So some of this is inherent in the way regional school districts are funded. Um, and some of it's about, um, you know, so if you look at some of the numbers uh, under some of the methods, um, oftentimes the numbers look pretty reasonable except for one town. And then everybody's got to go down because it's a proportional relationship in the budget. Whereas when you're talking about municipal government, um, the number's the number. And whether it's a good number or a bad number, the number's the number. Uh, but like, you know, for this year to make it work for Pelham, let's say, you have to then adjust everybody else. You can't be like, well, Pelham's really high. We'll knock down Pelham a little bit because that we're, we're unhappy that how high that is. And, and when you knock down Pelham, Pelham is is I don't know what percent of the budget is, but less than 10. Uh, and then you're knocking down Amherst, which is 79 percent of the budget. And then all of a sudden your budget gets a lot worse. So. Um, I think in communities in regional districts, from what I understand elsewhere, that are able to work more, work collaboratively together, not comparative, just work collaboratively together, they're able to work through some of these challenges. Um, in, our, in our situation right now, we have some fundamentally and very legitimate differences of opinion on the relation of each town to the assessment method. Uh, I really understand no one's unreasonable. I completely understand the point of view of people who are saying regional assessment method makes sense. It's predictable, it's reliable, and everyone pays the same amount per kit. There, there's good logic to that. I also understand the statutory method folks who are advocating for it because they're saying, well, if you're not taking account of wealth, there's an equity argument. Uh, and it's not fair for towns that have less capacity to pay, however we define that, uh, that they're paying the same amount as towns who um, have more capacity to pay. So I think fundamentally, the disagreement is 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 in very understandable, logical uh, kind of an arena where everyone has legitimate points. But at the end of the day, uh, we've not been able to successfully move towards a method that's re uh, predictable and reliable in the district. We haven't had the same method year, you know, two years in a row. Uh, Doug could tell me, but uh, it's got to be five or six years um, so, since we've had that. Maybe seven. Um, yeah. And so that that's a real challenge, you know, and I think it's just as much of a challenge for the towns as it is for the district, right? That the towns don't have predictability uh, in what happens. But, you know, um, again, I want to let the committee members comment. I want to get to ads and cuts. I have a lot to say about that. Um, but I did want to voice, you know, on behalf of the staff that this has major implications um, year after year for it. And, you know, uh, you know, I think it's getting to the point where people are sort of, um, the fatigue is setting in, you know, of this is going to be an annual ritual of not being sure if we have a budget and going, not being sure till we go to town meetings and we don't really know what's going to happen. And, and I think cumulatively that has a, a significant impact on the district, right? It's no one's fault, but the reality is it does. And I think my, my obligation is to share that with y'all. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? I think I saw some hands, but I can't remember who's. No. Okay. Are we ready to move on to? I think. Is it ads cuts next? Yeah. Well, I'll take. I'll uh, speak to this one. This one kind of just sets the stage for it. So, uh, fifteen point nine uh, FTE is full time equivalent reduction in staffing, and. That in, in, includes reductions, uh, and I know I'm reading the slide, but just for people who can't see it, in the district office, administration, professional staff, teaching staff, paraeducator staff. We tried to tie it as much as possible um, to student enrollment. You know, some good helpful feedback from a Shutesbury um, 
representative on Saturday that, you know, it's hard. You can't really, it's not as, as, as neat as saying these cuts are reduced or these reductions are based on enrollment. These ones are actual cuts because everything gets a little gray. But, but I think in general, that point was spot on that we tried to look at student enrollments that have been declining. Uh, and make those, but you know there will be likely increases in class size, fewer electing offerings, and a reduction in programming from these reductions. These are not pain-free cuts. Just to be really, really clear about it. Um, we tried as best we could to not fill vacancies for as many current staff members. You know, there's a and so looks like about 1.6 RIF notices, and that's three people. Sometimes they're powerful. RIF is reduction in force notices. Um, and, and there's multiple reasons why we did that. One is that uh, just very uh, pragmatically, we've had a goal of diversifying the teacher workforce and the educator workforce. We've been pretty successful in my estimation at doing that, doing thanks to the work of Doreen Cunningham and the principals. Um, we've increased to 50% in five years. And when you do that, and then you start making lots of cuts, you risk reversing the trends that you've had. Uh, pragmatically, it also makes sense to uh, riff as few people as possible financially because, you know, once you start going down that road, you, you may not realize the budget cuts you want because you're paying unemployment, you know, other things like that. So both kind of ethically consistent with the district's, you know, values. And frankly, we like the people we've hired. We've had great, great uh, teachers join our district in the last couple of years, regardless of whether they're, you know, their race, ethnicity or background. Uh, we want to retain as many of them as possible. So we can flip to the next slide, Doug. Okay, so I know this is kind of small, but I'll walk through them. So um, the first set is about district administration. So we have a vacant position, which is a family center outreach position who worked on youth leadership uh, at the secondary schools, ran uh, groups, particularly for students who are underserved in our districts. This is a painful reduction, but it is a, re it is a vacancy. And um, so that is um, the list. This is not in a particular order, by the way, in terms of like, top most important to less important this is just organized by uh, where it is in the organization we're looking at about half time just a shade under um, 0.5 reduction uh, in administration at the high school which will involve a challenging shift in roles and responsibilities reducing ten thousand uh, dollars interpreters at the secondary level that was based on the yellow program report we had last spring um, which noted that um, at the secondary level we want to be careful about how long we're um, our entry plan is for students uh, to have interpreters because at some point, especially with the content that's there, um, we don't want them teaching students. We want them, you know, getting them acclimated. And so um, we're able to make that reduction, but not without um, real cost to kids. Um, so information systems, there's $50,000 of reduction because we bought a number of many, many Chromebooks this year with CARES Act funds. So we don't need to replenish those. Um, so that's a relatively painless cut. In the facilities, we have a number of positions that have been, we've been unable to fill, and through the creative work of our facilities department, we've been able to get the work done. So um, it, it's not reducing anyone's position, but it's uh, kind of continuing the work we've been doing um, to, to still get things done in facilities um, with some different staffing models. We had a food service assistant um, position um, that's vacant that we're not filling. That's, and many of these are split with AMR, so you know the FDEs, the full-time equivalents look a little funny. Bilingual psychologists we posted, we weren't able to identify someone for that, so we're going to continue to contract uh, for evaluations as needed. So when we have students who are bilingual uh, who are being evaluated, uh, we'll, we'll find somebody to do those instead of a more integrated program um, that we'd hope for. We don't anticipate a lot of foot traffic uh, at central office next year because of COVID. So we're reducing a reception position in, in the district offices. Uh, we anticipate a staff turnover savings. We cut about 16 positions. You save some on uh, health insurance costs and others. And uh, for in our special ed department, this has already happened this year, uh, the current year. So it's tr um, just pushing it forward that we do have um, our intensive needs coordinator uh, is now K to 12 instead of it used to be a 712 position that's actually worked uh, really well. It's, it's connected our intensive needs programs uh, in ways that wasn't done before. So there is, it's an offset because there will be an ad to Amherst to cover that cost. In the high school, um, we have 1.8 positions in core academic, the core academic areas at the high school are world language, social studies, science, English, and math. Uh, the specifics of those reductions will be uh, will be known once students enroll for classes. 
Um, and so that will potentially have an increase on class size. We'll do as best we can based on enrollments um, to not have it uh, have a huge impact on class sizes, but uh, I can't promise that there won't be any. Uh, power reduction, this is just fewer students. So in terms of the um, students with special needs at the high school, we looked at the, their grids and based on students graduating and students we anticipate coming, uh, we feel comfortable with that. Um, there's an AmeriCorps position that worked in the academic support center that's vacant and we'll have to change, revise our model of academic support without that position. As a dean, uh, so we're going from two deans to, two, to one dean, which will be a, a significant challenge. It'll, um, yeah, it'll be a significant challenge, but it's a vacant position. Um, uh, reduction in special ed staff, again, this one is purely due to declining enrollment in some of our, some of our programs there. Um, so that's a 0.5 reduction. And reducing a clerical position, there's a vacant position next year at the high school, so reorganizing um, clerical responsibilities. Uh, I think I'll just go through all these and then take questions on them. At Summit Academy, um, there's a vacant para position, and we have some students coming in from other districts. Um, so that's actually generating funds, if, if that can be understood, uh, as opposed to an actual cut. At the middle school, it's reducing, uh, we have a half team, and we have for, for quite a few years. And so reducing that half team uh, will have an increase in class size for next year. Um, the middle school, the team model, there's no way to do partial FTEs the same way there is at the high school um, as it relates to core instruction. Uh, we'll have a vacant position next year in art. Um, so we're going essentially from two years ago, we had two teachers, two art teachers, to next year we'll have only one art teacher uh, at the middle school. Uh, likewise, at the school adjustment counselor is a vacant position, uh, 0.6, and uh, we will not fill that under this proposal. And finally, uh, there's a dance. Um, this would be reducing 50% of the dance uh, elective offerings that we have at the middle school and high school. Um, again, none of these cuts do I feel good about. I'm trying to be as neutral as I can talking about them, which is a challenge. Uh, and finally, reducing the PE and health uh, program. Uh, we'll have to revise the model at the middle school and high school. Um, all of these courses and all these impacts we know are really important to students. You know, I do not want to be reducing the budget by a million dollars. I do not want to be recommending 15.9 FTE and reduction, uh, but that's that's the deck of cards I have right now. Uh, and as hard as this is, I really want to compliment our team, your know, principals, uh, assistant principals, um, directors for coming up with a million dollars of cuts in the way that we feel like will have the lowest impact on students. And please note that I'm sa not saying no impact on students. It's the lowest possible impact on students. Um, and we may not have gotten it right. You know, that's why we have public comment. That's why we have a hearing. That's why we'll continue to receive feedback. Um, but it was a very challenging thing to do. Three of the last four years, we've had um, significant reductions um, at the regional level. And um, any, you know, the things we've done that are structural, like moving Summit to the high school, right, that saves $100,000 a year, which is great. Um, but then that gets woven into the operating budget. So we, we have become as efficient, I think, as we can become that way. Um, and that's where we end up with, with a significant amount of um, FTE cuts that you see in front of you. And I'll stop talking and see if there's comments or questions from the committee. Yeah. Um, so just as a reminder, what we'll do um, now is, is um, have any questions from the committee for, um, for Dr. Morris or uh, Dr. Slaughter on specifically these cuts um, to make sure that we're all understanding these, um, these proposals. Then we'll shift to the public comment, the hearing portion, and then we'll come back to um, comments from the committee. Um, I, I feel like, you know, hearing the public comment will, will enable a richer discussion when we, when we get to sort of our own comments. So if we can try to limit ourselves to clarifying questions and, and building understanding of what's being proposed here, um, and, then, and then hold comments um, for later. Uh, Ms. Spitzer. Thank you for sharing these. I'm similarly, I don't know, it's, it's just hard. Um, so I'm going to, I have a comment for later, but I, I guess um, going back somewhat to the town, four towns meeting, I think one of the things we heard from some members, not everybody, but was this thought that compared to other folks, other districts in the state of Massachusetts, we are spending 
more per pupil, that we're not necessarily being efficient with our dollars. Um, and that was hard to hear after going through rounds of cuts, you know, like knowing the history of how we're, what we've been doing over the past few years in terms of taking reduction. So I'm just curious, I think I know the answer, but I think just for the record, I'd be curious about your reaction to this idea that maybe there are things we could be doing more efficiently right now with the funds that we have available, because um, just, just as the leader of our district, I'm curious. Yeah, so I think a couple of things. First, I think, um, and this played out a couple of years ago when we made budget cuts. Um, trying to say this in the way I want to say it. Um, there is, and this isn't an Amherst thing or Amherst regional thing. This is everywhere. Everyone loves the idea of being lean, until, you, but no one likes the cuts that get you there, right? So a couple of years ago, and Mr. Sullivan is here, he'd comment on it. We, we cut our culinary program, we cut our child study program, and then we brought Summit into the high school. I think there's been a lot of benefits for Summit being in the high school, you know, some drawbacks, but definitely some benefits. Um, but some of the same people who are demanding that we reduce our budget were also people uh, who were really upset with me about the cuts that we made. And so, uh, you know, I think that's the hard thing. This is a community that really wants so much for its children. It's also a community that is, and I think committee uh, and district, if you look at the vision and mission statement, that's committed to social justice, that's committed to working and supporting underserved children and children and families who are underserved in our community. I'm not talking just about the schools, like families that are underserved, living in Amherst, living in Pelham, living in Shutesbury, living in Leverett. And so that costs money, right? And so does every district have a family center, which we're making a significant reduction to this year, um, who does incredible work. I mean, I was on the phone with Dr. Guevara or texting with her earlier tonight um, about the, you know, trying to problem solve what we're going to do for families without a distance learning center operating for the next three days. And um, no criticism of other communities. That's not the, that's not a challenge other communities have. And it's not a challenge that some communities want to look at and actually do something about. Um, not every community has 50 languages spoken and dedicates and, and there's reductions there too, right? In terms of translators, not every, not every district um, tries to do, um, tries the things that we try to do for, for our students that way. And then on, on, on the flip side, not every community wants to have a restorative justice program. Not every community wants to have an elective program that looks like a liberal arts college sometimes because we don't believe we want kids just waiting till their senior year to actually choose a course. That's not uncommon in schools, school district and schools across the country as well as in our area. Uh, and so there's a value on expression. There's a value on student choice. There's a value. And that's not efficient. So if we had like a very traditional model where ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade just went through the core sequence and there was no choice and no electives, there might be some efficiency. Um, however, I don't think that defines our community. So you know, I can understand people suggesting that, um, that we want to be more efficient and we want to reduce services. Um, and, you know, I mean, I could keep going on special ed, but I'm, I'm aware it's almost eight o'clock and I've done a lot of talking already. Um, but, you know, so my reaction is if we want to be a really different school district, we can absolutely do that. We can absolutely reduce cost. Uh, we would really have to review our mission statement and vision statement. I think it would have to shift. Uh, and we really want to communicate that we're making a very traditional school system. Um, and in the past, any inkling of that in my 20 years in the districts has not gone well. Um, you know, it's not been what many people want. I mean, many of you are on subcommittees or have been to subcommittee meetings who are, who are no one is advocating for less. At least, you know, when you're in CPAC or SETF uh, or BPAC, um, that's not what we hear. Uh, you know, and I think it makes our community better. Uh, our community demands things of our schools that perhaps not everyone in every community demands. And our schools are better because they demand it. It makes your job hard. It makes my job hard, um, for sure. Uh, but, you know, we try to do what we can to, to work with the great ideas we get from our community. So, you know, I'm all for being more efficient. You know, we had our per pupil study done. You know, I wasn't in this role. I think I was in my former role here in the district. 
And what it found is that we have more teachers on average, more paraeducators on average. We spend more energy on you know, special education, uh, smaller class size and electives than your typical district. Nothing in the terms of cost centers really changed. So I know there's some people advocating and someone talked to me about that after the four town meeting. And that's fine if people want to spend money to have a, you know, to do a study. If there's things to be learned, there's things to be learned that I'm not, I'm not anxious about that. Um, but the same trends are going to be true as they were six, seven years ago when that study was done. Uh, and, you know, if someone wants to kind of find that same information again, and maybe there's something in there we could look at. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, so, someone a while ago said, when I was going to this role, like, just remember, you're not, gonna, you're not trying to change Amherst. You're trying to make the district the best district it could be. Uh, and I feel like if I was trying to make Amherst regional public schools a really traditional district without electives, without some of the pieces around social justice and equity, um, first of all, it's not what I believe in, but I think on a larger scale, I don't think it would actually conform to what the community has told us they want for their children. Long-winded, my apologies. I'm going to be, I started so well tonight with the superintendent update too. You've all taken me on a bad train. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, thanks for the question. I'm sorry for my long-winded answer. Um, other questions? Mr. Demley. All right, I'm really just going to try to keep this an informational context comment. Feel free to cut me off. I'll try not to inject my opinion, but I feel like given what Dr. Morris just stated, you know, so this, this, this general question of municipalities asking school districts, hey, we, we're giving you the same funding level, even increasing it by inflation sometimes. Why do you keep eating more of our pie? And a big unstated thing is that over time, especially the last 10 plus years, the state of Massachusetts has slowly reduced the percentage of the budget that they fund and has slowly shifted the burden to municipalities. It's, you know, know your enemy, right? And Select boards and finance boards and town councils and school committees are un and regional school districts are united on this. Our enemy is the state. That's, you know, and, and it's a state that's been driven by a certain policy agenda that I won't get into in the last six years um, plus um, that, has, that has led to this. And we are also, uh, because the type of districts that we are, especially hurt by some of the, the policy adjustments, you know, the unfunded mandates that I won't go through, we particularly rely on those. And the charter school formula, which which the state has resisted um, updating, even though everybody knows that it's broken and unfair, uh, really hurts us. I know I always harp on that, but um, but those are factors that are out of our control, uh, and they're out of uh, select board control and out of a town council's control that are really putting the pressure on on local school committees. And so it's you know we still have to deal with it. We still have to set this budget. And we're not going to change what's happened in the last 10 years in the state overnight. You know, I, I know Representative Dome and Blay and Senator Comerford are doing their best and they understand all this. Um, but that really is a big part of what is turning the screws on this, you know, and, and, and makes us fight uh, and, and creates a level of conflict that should not be there. It's because the state is failing to support public schools. I'll stop my opinion, Amy. <laughs> um, I, I did have one sort of clarifying question just to help. Um, I think I know the answer, but maybe for folks watching at home, um, it would be helpful to explain just as, a, as an example, um, in the middle school, you have two, two vacant positions and yet each of those adds up to just um, point, point 0.6 of a full-time um, equivalent. So can you explain um, sort of how those those numbers are arrived at when you're saying that it, you're eliminating a, vac a currently vacant position, but it only gets us half of a person. Yep. So the school adjustment counselor is is literally the it's not a full time position. So it's um, it's a six tenths of a position, and uh, sometimes when it's vacant, it could be vacant for a number of reasons. Either the person who is in the role. Um, is moving to a different place or uh, isn't returning for whatever reason, or sometimes it's vacant next year because someone may be taking a leave of absence. Um, so not every position that we have in our district is a full-time position, and that's particularly true at the regional level. Um, at, at the elementary level, the ma vast majority of positions are full-time. There's, there's a much higher incidence of um, part-time positions at the secondary level. Okay. Thank you. Any um, further questions? Miss Kenny.
So kind of following along on that same line, so mm -hmm. there's a few that say vacant position for FY22. Does that mean in FY23, they will no longer be vacant, that position is being eliminated? How does, how does that work? So um, I'm going to be very careful on how to respond because sometimes these are easily identified. No, 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 no not a, not a, it's not an apology thing, but just these are pretty identifiable uh, positions and not everyone who's in the position or was in the position or would be in the position has shared their piece. So uh, I think the short story is that um, there's a number of reasons why it would be vacant. It might be a retirement. Uh, it might be that someone's taking a leave next year and that a year from now we will have to revisit uh, whether it remains vacant uh, indefinitely. I know your point was not to go down that road, but I just wanted to explain why I was going to be a little vague in answering. It's just more protection for staff members who are identifiable on this sheet. Yeah, it was more a matter of does that, like, is that, never mind. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a challenge in FY23, you know, if we're not able yeah. to restore any of these positions. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. If there's no further questions, we'll move now to um, the, the public uh, hearing part of our of this discussion, and then we'll come back to um, to committee comments. We have one um, voice uh, recording, so I will play that while I pull up the written comment. Hello, my name is Amanda Lewis, and I am a Holyoke resident and a paraprofessional at ARHS. I work in the Academic Achievement Center, a place where we provide academic emotional support for a diverse group of 9th to 12th graders. I am honored to get to work with incredible young people every day. Students are doing their best to survive a pandemic while also doing school, care work, working, learning how to drive, trying to make sense of the world, navigating relationships, etc. Many of the students I work with were struggling academically before the pandemic and continue to struggle academically during remote instruction. As we review the proposed regional budget cuts, I am extremely concerned about the impact on my students, my colleagues, particularly fellow paraprofessional colleagues, and myself. A return to safe and engaging in-person learning in the coming months will bring its own set of logistical, social, and emotional challenges for students, staff, and families, challenges we do not yet know how to anticipate. We are all dealing with significant ongoing trauma from the pandemic and the compounding effects on existing social inequity in our community. For students at the high school, some of the proposed cuts may look like fewer paraprofessionals to provide valuable support, reduction of the dean position, and access to some of the elective classes that students look forward to most. All of these reductions will immediately impact students' access to support and connection during a time where we need more support and resources, not less. I urge the town to get creative and make sure our budget reflects our community values. For instance, community members and organizations have great ideas about how to look holistically at our town budget to ensure that we put resources towards education and other services that increase equity and access in our community by looking critically at cuts in places like policing. This is a key moment to come together to invest resources in alignment with our values as a community. Whether you are in favor of a swift return to in-person learning or believe it's not safe yet, I hope that we can all agree that funding our schools must be an urgent priority and commit to advocating and funding accordingly. If we care about equity and access in our community for all of our young people, we need to commit to funding our schools. Thank you for your work. Are folks seeing, um, seeing this uh, comment? Okay. Um, and I will uh, remind folks that this is um, posted on the Regional School Committee agendas page. And I'm going to go somewhat quickly through this because you'll, you'll start to see that these are um, uh, very similar, similarly worded uh, letters, um, but I will uh, pause and, and do my best to enable legibility.
lost my mouth. Um, Um, so uh, before we move on to the school committee comment, I, I do want to acknowledge that a lot of that comment was um, uh, was directed um, and, and, and mentioned um, the funding for the schools in relation to other town services. Um, and for those that are watching at home, um, those we appreciate and thank you for sharing those comments with us as they relate to cuts to the school budget. And um, uh, another um, outlet would be to uh, share those same comments with your town, um, the town officials, whether if it's in Amherst, the town council, um, or the select board or town managers in, in, um, in our other member towns. Um, though that is where those decisions are being made in, in terms of weighing the funding for the schools versus other town services. Um, with that, what we're going to do now is move on to school committee comment. Um, and as I described um, and shared with, with the committee beforehand, I'm going to take a slightly different approach. I want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to speak before, um, before others have opportunity or second comment. Um, so I want to make sure that everybody um, who would like to speak has that opportunity. Um, and so I'm going to... Um, ask for forgiveness for the first person that I'm going to call on. I'm going to just go around my screen. And once each of us has had an opportunity to speak, um, then we'll go back for um, any follow up comments that folks might have um, as we continue this discussion. So like I said, I'm going to apologize for the poor soul who is going to be I'm going to um, tag first. Um, but that as I'm going to start with um, Ms. Seeger. I was afraid of that. Um, <laughs> so I'll see if I can keep my thoughts organized. Um, I, I think for, first and foremost, I'm sad and disappointed by this budget that that we're here again in the second year in a row making this this incredibly drastic cut that we're that we're entertaining this. Um, I heard loud and clear from the comments that people are asking us to reject this budget. Um, I don't feel like we have base to, which is the unfortunate part. I don't, I don't feel like we have a lot of control here because of the way we have four different towns with four different ideas of how things work. And, and lo and behold, we could end up at the statutory method this year, which would really um, adversely affect two of the four towns. So it feels like we have, it feels like to me that I have no good, good choice in this. Um, I am afraid of our school district um, decl uh, just declining in what, what can be offered um, and the effect that overall it's going to have on all, all four of our towns. If we lose families, people don't look to um, Amherst anymore as the place to send their children to school because that's why I moved here. You know, I live in Leverett, but it's because the school's good in Leverett. It is because the school in Amherst is great. It's that's why I'm here. And I hear from so many families that that's why we moved to these towns, all four of them. And we've actually lived in two of the four towns. Um, so I, I'm worried about that. That's going to have a long term effect on our housing prices. Um, it's, you know, hopefully we don't keep doing this year after year. Um, one of the things with the specific cuts is you know, getting into a specific thing is I don't know sort of the whole budget and what we spend money on. So I look at these cuts and I'm deeply appreciative of that, that you're able to um, find these areas, Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter. Um, I don't know what other possibilities there are, but I do notice that that art and dance is getting trimmed back. And I'm concerned because I don't know how much money is spent on things like sports. So I just want to make sure that there's a balance in what is cut this year. Um, and that we're not leaning in one direction and kids lose maybe valuable after school things because the teachers aren't there as a resource anymore. Um, I, I think, uh, I don't know what else to say that that's, that's as organized as I was able to get, but I have a very hard time supporting this budget. Um, I know a lot of the comments are asking us to reject this budget. I don't know what the comment, but what, what you do if you reject this, because ultimately um, we vote on a budget and it's up at the towns. Then the towns vote on the budget. And if, if the towns reject the budgets, you know, we're 
kind of, it would be good to submit to the towns a budget that we think will generally be supported. Um, but it is really hard to support this budget. Thank you. Um, Ms. Stancer. Okay. Um, so I may be going to read some of my thoughts. Um, first thing I want to say is that I don't personally think this is the time to be cutting education. I think if anything, we should be increasing education funding. Um, however, I think that we're faced with a really stark reality. Um, we've heard it all, just what Ms. Seeger said and other things. Um, and I think that the pandemic this year has just exacerbated what's been happening with education funding for a number of years. Um, in Massachusetts, cities and towns are paying more because the state pays less to support education. I've been, I looked through about seven or eight years worth of school budgets and you can see it just gradually going down, down, down what the state is willing to pay. In Massachusetts, um, as Mr. Demling stated, we have legislated mandates for things that we're supposed to do, but the state has not fully funded the things that they've legislated. So they're not giving us enough money to do the things that they've told us we have to do. That's pretty hard. Um, I also think nationally, you know, this whole thing about lean and tax cutting, you know, I come from California where they originally passed Proposition 13, which in a lot of ways was the beginning of this whole attitude about let's cut taxes. There's a fat in everything. And so we're gonna make people be more efficient. We're gonna cut the fat out. Well, we just keep cutting. And I mean, I can't, well, I just, um, and I, so I think what's happened is that um, people now have dissociated from the fact that we pay taxes to get services. All they say is, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but it's how I feel that people say, well, let's cut taxes. I don't want to have to pay those taxes. But then you just can't have the services if you don't pay the taxes. And I think somehow that has just gotten divided in a lot of people's minds. So I guess what I would say is I think, you know, we're really up against a very difficult thing. And I I agree, I think with Ms. Seeger, I, I, I think we have, well, I don't think we have to do it, but I, I think we have to vote on, on the budget because I don't know that statutory is going to be good for anybody. Um, and also, um, I think if we were to cut, I mean, this is bad enough, a million dollars, we're really starting to eat into what we can do, but it also becomes a value judgment for our communities what kind of schools do we want to have? You know, we're decreasing offerings of all kinds. We're decreasing special ed. We're decreasing language, English language learners. We're decreasing what we can do on equity issues. Um, we're decreasing electives and honors courses options for students. I mean, it's everything. And if we were to go any deeper than this, I mean, this is already cutting into that. Any deeper than this would, would be really change that, as Dr. Morris said, I don't think this is what our communities want. So there you have my opinion, <laughs> opinions or thoughts. Thank you. Um, Mr. Harrington. Yeah, so this is tough, right? So. When we look at when you look at budgets, right, it's, it's a moral document. This is like a statement of values, basically, right? And so, I, I think for me, the, the part I can't kind of get past is like the human factor, right? Minimally, let's take a, take a second and think about there are three people who will not have employment going forward, right? Reduction in force letters going out. So that that's that's tough to deal with. But like the kind of like 
looking at looking at the cuts that we have to make. And I, I hate to say that. Like I, I I don't want to cut a single thing from our edu from from our budget in regards to education. That's why I'm here. That's why like like my, my family's in Connecticut. My support system is in Connecticut. I remain here with my son because of the quality of education. And and so like I mean, thinking about like our, our district's mission statement, right? We, you know, we value equity, we value multiculturalism, and we can't afford, and, and that's, that's the reality of it, right? We can't afford to have the, a, a family center outreach coordinator, right? That's, so we're, we're taxing those folks, right? They, they have to work a little bit harder. Not even a little bit harder. I don't, I don't want to diminish that at all. They have to work a lot harder to, to reach out to our community to actually communicate with our community and they've, they've been you know a conduit between the the school district and the community throughout this whole kind of pandemic and then um and then i think about like I, I don't know if it's a shock to anyone that that infrastructure has like that's that's my, where my mind goes immediately to and, and we're looking at um we're looking at not filling vacancies with specialists right one of those specialist positions is an HVAC position, right? And clearly that's that's been the the bulk of work that's been done and in, in, in also in an electrician. And in the long term effects of, of not having these folks it, it, is that it's going to cost more to maintain the things that we can't maintain. Right. And and I th I think, you know, when, when you look at it, that it's it's echoed throughout this, right? Things that we can't maintain that are going to cost more in the long run, right? You know, people who are going to have to work that much harder. And so, I mean, if any, if anyone out there is, is is able to communicate to us a, a better way to do it, in, in an actual better way to do it, than to have these cuts here, I'm I am more than open and willing to hear it. But I I flat out don't see a better option. And I also see that we 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 could have cut a lot more. And, and we're probably going to have to continue to cut in the years to come if certain trends continue. But the, the 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 other thing that I would ask for the public to do is is to kind of if if you believe that that we should fund the police department or other town services less and give us that money, advocate to the town council. That's them. But more more so than that, we need to be advocating to the state and to our representatives to have them push, put pressure on the state to fund education, right? This is our future we're talking about. It's not, this isn't like a frivolous expenditure here, right? This is, this is our children's future. And, and I mean, I, we're not the only people feeling the pain, but right now in this moment, I mean, I'm definitely feeling it. And I, I, I don't see anyone here who isn't feeling it equally. I don't see a happy face on this screen. Right. So that's about where I'm at is the, the, is, kind of the re realization of how tough this is right now. So. Thank you. And Ms. Spitzer. Thanks. Um, I was heartened by all the students who, who wrote in and, and that actually brought me back to, um, you know, when I was a college student, I remember uh, my grandfather forwarded me and I went to Amherst High School and noticed that we were cutting German from those class offer offerings. And so I typed an email <laughs> and um, said, you know, let's not cut German. And while I wish we still offered German, like to me, that seems like a really like, wouldn't that be great if there were things that were such low hanging fruit to cut? Because I think when I look at the things that were being proposed and not just in any year, but in a year where all of us, um, have suffered through this pandemic and and i'm really worried about when we return to in-person learning and there are fewer adjustment counselors where a family center has less staff where we have fewer teachers and larger class sizes but all of our students needs have got increased and we know from data that these the burden of this pandemic has not been evenly distributed um, across our community that the most vulnerable members of our um community, you know, the, the pandemic has hurt them, hit them harder. And I guess, you know, I, d I don't know what to do because I know our, our town is facing, um, is facing challenges fiscally. So it's, it's not to say that these, these cuts are anything that um, I think are 
our town leaders would want to make. Um, but it's just, it, it's just really, really hard and in a year where I think our students are actually going to need more to be able to give them less. And if the facilities is, is a great point, like it's not just in terms of like adjustment counselors, it's everything is going to, I think, be to be different and to have to return to the buildings in a year where we're, where we have less to, to meet more needs is just really, really frustrating. Um, so I, I want to echo the request for folks to advocate for um, the school budgets at all of the levels. Um, you know, I think all of us were kind of hoping with 2021 was, you know, going to be this great new year. Um, we have new federal leadership, but I don't think anybody's, you know, riding in on a white horse and is going to, you know, suddenly have buckets of money that will be um, able to to support our schools. I am hoping that maybe we will get some federal funds that might ease some of this burden. And I just want to recognize, like, I'm, I'm very grateful that we have at least, you know, no, we're not facing those 1.4 to 1.7 million cuts. I think it's worth, you know, recognizing at least that's a little bit better than what we were facing before. So um, I guess I would be just curious about if we do fail to pass the budget, what, what, um, what would the 112th budget option um, look like if, if something like that were to happen? Um, it's something I'd like to understand better. Not necessarily tonight, it's getting late. But those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, Ms. Kenny. Okay. Um, so let's see. I, I think I, ha I have a lot of feelings about the budget, and I can see my colleagues here. I think everybody else does also. And I, um, so I'm going to apologize in advance because when I have feelings about things, I am not necessarily particularly linear in my thought process. Um, so my family, you know, we moved to the area in when I was going into the seventh grade and we moved for the school system. Um, I went through the middle school and high school, same with my brothers. I moved my own family to the Amherst and Pelham so my children could go through this school system um, because the value, uh, the core value of the district, right, with uh, the social justice and the multiculturalism and the things that we hold dear and the high value we put on those things were what not just drew my family, but what draws lots of families to our area. And these are our children we're talking about, right? And the best thing we can do for anything is to invest in your future, right? And our children are our future. And giving them the best education we can, which includes languages and dance and health and all of the great things we've been able to provide for our children in the past, that is what is able to give them bright futures. So I agree that we, I, I feel like my hands are tied. I feel like we are stuck between a rock and a hard place and I'm not sure what to do about the budget. I am so impressed that this is what Dr. Slaughter you've come up with and all of the people you work with to have it be, not that this isn't detrimental to everybody, but it is, it feels like uh, least harm, I guess. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what to do. I, I haven't been on regional school committee for long enough or any school committee, honestly, to know what happens if you don't approve the budget. So I, I guess I have questions about what happens if you go that way. Um, so those are my thoughts for now, I guess. Um, there's a few of us left, but I, because two members have asked the kind of the same question, I don't know, Dr. Slaughter or Dr. Morris, if you'd be willing to sort of respond to that. Yeah, I can, I can do that. So the first question, the two things I'd written down were athletics. There was a comment about, and we did make reductions to athletics a few years ago. Um, we reduced the number of games and, and 
you know, what we looked at is um, the next step on athletics would be, um, you know, the, when we looked at it a couple of years ago was, you know, do you eliminate some sports? But then it really comes up with equity issues because the sports that generally uh, would quote unquote save the most money, um, they save that because the students who are playing are often, you know, receiving subsidized support and the sports that are not losing money would, you know, so we had a hard time. So we did already make a reduction in athletics a couple of years ago. And I think it was before you were on the committee, um, uh, Ms. Seeger. So, you know, when we looked at it, like that next set doesn't seem like, you know, something we could do because we've already made a reduction in, in athletics. Um, uh, but, you know, it's certainly open to feedback, but I just, you know, again, just giving the history, I think hopefully is important. Um, in terms of a budget, so uh, you all do need to pass a budget. So just to be really clear, like process wise, like, um, you know, there does need to be the school committee does need to vote a budget. I think the question was if the budget isn't supported by all the member communities. Um, so I can send there's a memo from Desi and Doug. If you can't pull it up, I can probably pull it up that we, we can send to the committee that describes the process. But the short story is um, you go on a one twelfth budget, which means that um, the state will determine the appropriate budget amount. It'll take into account what budget the school committee passed, whether there was an increase, um, and then they um, will divide that by 12 and they will give you the funds and in increments at a month. And then if it goes beyond, I think it's November, or December, and I can't remember exactly which month, then, then there's a little bit of a different process if you still don't have a budget passed. Um, but the short story is the state determines the budget, it does uh, what they told us two years ago when this came up, it does, does default to their methodology, which would be the statutory method. Um, and they determine the assessment amounts and as well as the total amount. So there's a couple districts, um, Rehoboth, what's the, the, it's another regional district. They have not passed the budget, I believe in two years. So um, we can try to, is it Dudley Rehoboth? I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember. I'm sorry. I'm not so good. I've lived here my whole adult life and I, I still can't get the towns right. Um, but there, there are a couple examples of what's happened. Um, but in general, what I've seen, um, the state is, is generally, as long as the increase is pretty reasonable from the school committee, the state has supported the school committee's position, but it often changes the assessments between the towns in that situation. Um, so we can get a, a like there, there is information on the state website and Doug, if I could ask you to try to pull that up, uh, and share it with Sasha via the committee or directly to the committee. I think it, it describes it better than I can very briefly. Cause I think it, it goes into much more detail. Is Seeger, is it a clarifying question on that topic or is it for, okay, go ahead. You're muted. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out, Dr. Morris, that I was thinking, if the four towns, if one of them refused the budget and we had to go back to the table, that means that I believe all four towns, and especially affecting Pelham, Shutesbury, and Leverett, have to have another town meeting, which in a pandemic year has been really hard to start with. So I can't imagine going into another year where hopefully we will be out of this by then. But you know, that's it wouldn't be simple. Um, providing a town refuse a budget. I mean, it's, yeah, I just want yeah. to add to that. Yeah, and actually, if I could clarify this for the committee as well as the community, because this is something that always gets confused. So um, if you're if districts, regional districts are not using the statutory method, then they need agreement of all four towns on the whatever method they choose. That's not the statutory method. Um, so at all the town meetings, and then now with the Amherst Town Council, there's actually two votes in the budget. One is the assessment method, which anything other than the statutory requires a unanimous vote of the communities. And then there's the budget, which requires three out of four. But the budget's like the second vote, right? If you, if the four towns don't agree on the statutory method, the budget vote is moot because you you can't actually assess the towns that. So that that's where it gets a little confusing um, is the assessment method. If there's not agreement, um, then you just keep on circling back to that. And that's to your point of the town meetings where things could get very complicated because the town meetings don't happen all on the same day. So it could be the case that everyone's passed the budget and the last town to go, whether that's Amherst Town Council or one of the town meetings doesn't pass it. And then the towns that have already had their town meeting can't just redo their, like they can't casually get back together again to solve this problem. Um, so I think that's a really important point. Thanks, Ms. Seeger. Okay. Um, and I believe we have um, 
Ms. Lord, Mr. Dimling, and myself left um, to comment. So I'll start with uh, you, Ms. Lord. Thank you. I want to first mention that the fact that the way we fund public schools is a racist and classist system. It's widely unfair and problematic. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I also acknowledge that the Amherst district, Amherst district is not underserved. We have many resources that other school districts do not. And yet, they have us fighting over what we perceive to be limited resources in the scarcity model. And I, I want to reject that model. If this country ever, ever prioritized our children as a priority of national security over the perceived need for walls or weapons, I believe we would be better off. At the end of the day, I always say that in terms of our national security, our biggest and our best investment involves our children. To me, they are surely the most important intervention, investment that we could ever make. Their mental health, their civil engagement, their access to educational advancement is truly where we as citizens in this country is about and where the majority of, I, I would hope, our tax dollars should be engaged. They are truly the investment in our future and how we support, support our youth and as engagement in the future is a longer conversation when we need to fight on the state and our national level. I wanna thank this administration for keeping their commitment to the restorative justice position as the SETF chair. It was really important and to see that that was not one of the cuts, I, I thank you for that position can cover possibly and un regrettably some of the other positions positions that have been cut by our um, intended, intended proposed cuts. <coughs> Sorry, I'm wrestling here. <laughs> I heard a few town counselors engaged in the discussion around staff salaries on Saturday. And for a moment, I engaged, I engaged in this as well. But sadly, I came to the conclusion that my work as a black woman with two master's degrees has been undervalued in these institutions that have systemic racism at their root in their DNA. Teachers and paras work, they work way and well beyond whatever we pay them. So I hope that we um, pull back from criticizing whatever step increases or salary increases that they might have. They are invaluable and underserved, uh, underpaid, undervalued in our, our country. So I just have to put that out there that, yeah, maybe we could save some if we freezed everything, but no, they're hands-on frontline with our kids. <laughs> um, Thank you to all who interact with our children. Um, I also acknowledge that this model has been set up in opposition, the scarcity property model, which we're not gonna change tonight, with homeowners who would like have no children but prioritize the dog park because they have dogs and they wanna, hey, let's have a dog park or let's fix the potholes. It's not a good system. We're stuck in it for now we work to change it, but here's where we're at. I um, admit that I, at the end of the day, I, I approach this budget more with heart than with like adherence to budgetary demands or fiduciary obligations. <laughs> um, but I offer no apologies. I believe we need more heart to triumph in this world, district and town. Um, I do not want this million dollar budget cut. It hurts me deeply to think about what some of our youth needs may be lost in the cut or it will be lost in the cut and the financial restraints. Um, 
Yeah. So I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> I don't know if that makes any more sense to any of y'all, but it's where I'm coming from, what I value, what I believe. I, I just wish we had a different model for funding our public education because our youth, I will say again, is our best investment in national security. They are our future. They are our blessings. They are wildly important to me. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Demling. Um, thank you, Ms. Lord, for those comments. Um, so um, a lot to say here. I'll try to pack it in. Um, so first, to all the young people who advocated tonight, please keep it up. Um, it was awesome to hear. Uh, so keep keep uh, your input for your schools, your towns. Stay involved and demanding. And I, practically speaking, think that you can be a force to influence things this year. So, you know, there's not a lot of time left in this budget season, but we do have a month or so. Please, so please keep it up. I appreciate that. Um, as, as to the assessment method, um, you know, I come up with two, two minds for this. One is, what's the most practical compromise for this year's budget? And to me, it's pretty obvious that it's, it's the 55 um, method. Um, that's the one that, from what I heard, was was in the consideration scope of all but Amherst. And for Amherst, uh, it would be seventeen thousand dollars more than the forty-five, and it still would be within the one point five percent guidance we got. So I actually don't understand why they weren't willing to do the fifty-five. So, I mean, so for practical terms, that seems to be the the short term of this year solution. For the long term solution, which you know I consider more after hearing Dr. Morris talk about the chronic problem we have. Um, I would almost say let's not take off the table the modified statutory, the 100%, the pink column there. Um, and I'll just be blunt. I think Amherst can afford that. Uh, it's less than a $100,000 uh, increase from the 45. And it gets us to a method that we could say, this is now the method going forward. We're at statutory. Um, and the increases are, 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 are manageable enough, I think, um, maybe with some special assistance for Pelham um that that we could get there i don't know if politically the towns would would go for that um but if you if, if we're just talking about long term that then that could be a solution um as to the the budget level i mean i, I echo all of my colleagues comments and um i'm not okay with this level of cuts our public schools have become a comprehensive social service organization for the community that so many of our residents rely on for way more than the academic um uh, education of their children. And we shouldn't lose 16 staff positions at exactly the time that we need to increase the, increase at this point has been made by others. Um, and these are forever cuts, right? This, this isn't just they're, they're on the shelf and they come back. Unless we think we're getting a six to 10% future budget increase, these things are gone. And we all like to say people move to Amherst for the schools. That will come to an end if we keep doing this. Uh, and I agree, it is primarily the nation's fault and the state's fault for not being the humanitarian social service uh, uh, organization that it isn't. Um, but here we are and we have to make a choice. So I, I will say that I think the school should be prioritized, uh, uh, prioritize municipal service over other municipal services during this educational crisis because of the educational crisis. And I would encourage any members of the public um, who feel like this budget level, this cut level is not what you want, contact your town council, contact your select boards, let them know. Because we, we do have to propose uh, a value that we think can be approved. Um, as to that level and what it should be, um, I want to respond to a request from um, an Amherst town councilor and some comments that were made at the Four Towns meeting um, uh, where a councilor said, quote, I don't see what we are getting for the extra money spent. You could say we're overfunding our schools. Um, and then a uh, counselor followed up with an email, quote, please be willing to talk about whether our community values regarding education versus other functional areas of town services have changed. And further quote, maybe our collective community values have shifted away from many of the extra non-state mandated programs being offered to small subsets of student populations that cost potentially large amounts of money. So, okay, so, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about our budget values um, in, in that way. And, and I, I, I start from our mission statement um, and, and just to briefly quote from it, that our mission of our schools is to provide all students 
with a high quality education and that we seek to create an environment that achieves equity for all students and assure, ensures that each student is a successful learner. And so when I applied that to the budget process, I go back to this guiding principle, I think Mr. Harrington mentioned about being a moral document, that a budget is a moral document. We fund what we value. So when we consider our array of services that we currently fund that aren't state mandated, that serve small subsets of students, what are we getting for this money? Is it worth it? Do we value it? When we talk about our students with disabilities and specialized in district programs, so they don't have to be bussed out of town. The co-teachers that foster inclusion in the regular classroom. <laughs> the paraprofessionals we heard about in public comment, the what provide one-to-one -one support for our students so they can participate with their typically developing peers in chorus, the high school play, sledding down the Wildwood Hill. I mean, none of this is state mandated. And their small subsets of students is, do we value that experience for these, for these students? Should we pay for the family center that helps students overcome income inequality through direct outreach and academic and social supports to, to level the playing field? Again, not state mandated. Do we value that to support our one in three students who are low income? Or how about our participation in the Minority Student Achievement Network? So this is an organization, they call themselves a national coalition of multiracial school districts that come together to understand and eliminate opportunity achievement gaps that persist in their schools. I mean, that is right down Main Street of our, of our mission, right? And so we send students to these conferences and they come back with action plans student-directed action plans to make our schools more equitable, not required, small subset. Should we, do we value this? Um, you know, and you, this is a, not a comprehensive list. I haven't even talked about restorative justice or the Bright program or the district-wide anti-racism training or the, the, the new PD professional development for trauma-informed classrooms for young children or the array of, of ways in which we approach academics for, for those that are on a, a very high performing track or those who are on a vocational track or those who really engage in our thriving performance arts program where so many other schools don't even have arts programs anymore. We don't have to do any of it. So if, if, if students come to our schools and they don't have the same level of need, they have a higher level of need because of their physical disability, their cognitive ability, from systemic racism, from the economic inequality of our, of our society, from personal trauma, or, or, or they simply come to us with a, you know, like a beautiful diversity of, of language and culture. Should we fully meet their needs if it's not state mandated? And so I put that question to the public to please tell us and tell the leaders of our towns, our budget is a moral document, what should we value? And that will determine what our budget level should be. Thank you. Sorry, it's clicking the wrong buttons there. Um, so I guess the, the disadvantage of going last is the impatience of sort of building up, but the advantage is that um, I, I hear all of the voices of all of my colleagues on the, on the committee and I don't need to add as much um, other than I've share, I think Ms. Kenny, you talked about the, the your, your volume of feelings and, and it makes it difficult to speak. And I, I share that. Um, and I think I share the sentiment and perspective that all of you have already shared. Um, and in particular, we talk about it a lot and I've heard it so many times already just this evening from each of you about our budget being a moral statement and a statement of our values. And like what I've heard from many of you, I'm not comfortable that this budget really does reflect our district values. I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. Um, we pride ourselves on the rich and varied programming that meets every student's needs, um, even those, you know, the small groups um, of the population. We have curriculums and offerings of, for high achieving college bound students that are rigorous and as Dr. Morris mentioned, rivaled out of many private schools and liberal arts schools. And we heard from some of our speakers tonight how valuable that was for their, um, their trajectory. We have the specialized programming and support for special needs students that's inclusive and sets them up for rich lives after graduation. We have a wide array of amazing electives available even for ninth graders that engage every student's level of learning beyond their core academics, which is particularly helpful for those for whom core academics doesn't really energize them and engage their level of learning. 
outreach support and programming to help all families feel welcomed and included in our school community. Incredible teachers and staff who continually go the extra mile for our students and build relationships that make impressions on our kids that last a lifetime. And we heard, we heard that again from the alumni that spoke tonight um, and the professional development to ensure that our teachers, paraeducators and staff are continually learning and growing and are engaged in our community of learning. The voices we heard tonight from this former students are such inspiring evidence of this that I don't even need to go in and describe it more. I think um, you know the varied stories that they told of their experiences in our school system and what they, what they see for their futures just is loud enough. Um, we've made significant cuts over the last two to three years and our district has squeezed as much as it can while minimizing as much as possible the direct impact on our students. And I'm sure there's always inefficiencies that could be found if we look hard enough that might save a few dollars here or there. Any inefficiencies in our current budgets will not add up to a million dollars in cuts. And we heard that tonight with that list of cuts. Cuts of this size that we're looking at will permanently reshape the nature and character of our public secondary schools. And I would argue do not match the values of our community. And I, again, will list all the things that each of you has described as being evidence um, or fits spending that we are making, the investments that we're making in our schools, whether it's the Family Center, um, the Bright Program Restorative Justice, um, professional development, all of those are things that, that reflect our values and we want to maintain those as much as possible. Um, so I think as um, uh, Ms. Seeger and Ms. Stancer started, started us out, it's really hard to support this budget. Um, and I share the, the belief that, that uh, each of you has shared also that this is as much um, a reflection of our state and federal um, priorities and values. And in the current year, there isn't a lot that we can do that's going to impact FY22. So it sucks um, that this is, these are the choices that we have to make and that it's, it is a zero sum game for each of our member towns and then within our own school district budget. Um, so it's a, it's a both and. I think, you know, the advocacy on the state and federal level to sort of get that full funding you know, now more than ever, um, need to raise our voices in support of that. And what do we do for this particular year? Because that's not going to change that for us. Um, uh, yeah, I don't have a solution. I do think um, one of the things that we we should, as a as a committee, have a conversation on um, is, with all things considered, were we to you know, A, the first question is, do we want to accept the million dollars in cuts? Do we want to ask the district to look for fewer cuts? If we are accepting the million dollars in cuts, are these the right cuts um, that we want to be making? Um, and I think that's sort of where I'd like to see us sort of wrestle with that a little bit um, and, and sort of come with some sort of direction or at least, um, you know, next steps to guide Dr. Slaughter and Dr. Dr. Morris in their next um, round of, of budget work here. Um, so, yeah, Dr. Morris. So just, um, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just had uh, two things to say, but certainly. No, go ahead. Okay, so one is just, if Ms. Gribko wanted to speak, I know we go around the room and sometimes oh, uh, yes. she doesn't necessarily jump in as much, which I, if I was her age, I'd be like hiding under you know, something I wouldn't have agreed to do this. So kudos to you for being part of this. Uh, I think on the other part, I want to say with budget is we, you know, we doing, we're doing, the, having this hearing um, about a month before we'd actually vote the budget. So I do think that there may be an opportunity to come back and have, you know, Ms. McDonald asked a question at the end of her statement. And um, I think for us, you know, we are, I think, slated to meet next week and the week after. Um, so, you know, I think we, we could think about it, an agenda item to, like, it's not like this is the end and then a month from now we come back and vote. If, if the committee wants more dialogue, we certainly can do that and that can be, you know, filtered through the chair or myself. Um, but, you know, if Ms. Gripko wanted to speak, to loop back to my first point, just wanted to give her the opportunity. Yes, thank you. Ms. Gripko? Yeah, I just have a couple things. Um, so one, like, obviously, 
from a student perspective, we don't want cuts and that's, you know, hard to hear that that's going to happen. Um, and, you know, looking at the public comments, I sort of saw that happen, the like advocacy around that, like on social media and stuff. And that was really interesting to see. Um, and I think one of the big takeaways from that is that there was a little bit of just misunderstanding about like who is controlling this and where it's coming from and, you know, who's making the decisions around this. So I think um, just being really clear about the process may be something that I think from a student perspective would be a little bit helpful or more helpful. Um, and yeah, I think just in general, like this is really a community decision. So from a student perspective, like I think that things like public comment um, are really helpful. Dr. Morris. And, it, and Ms. Grupko, if there's, um, you know, a group of student leaders that you think it'd be helpful, you know, if I came or Ms. McDonald or some combination of, of us to, to offer some clarity, um, you know, about the points you raise, just let me know. I'd be happy. And I want to volunteer Ms. McDonald, but she's nodding her head. Yes. Uh, you know, we'd be happy to sit down with, with any leadership group or, you know, group that you're on um, so that students can get accurate information to your point about clarity on the process and where, where these decisions get made. Um, just let, let me know and I'll be there. Um, so on, on your other comment about sort of the questions that I posed, I do think, um, given the hour and we still have a few um, big topics to discuss that um, I might propose when um, that we continue this conversation at our at our next um, uh, meeting where we haven't posted an agenda already. Um, but I want to, I, I promise that we, I would give everybody an opportunity to sort of follow up um, once everybody's had a chance to speak. So I want to look around the room and see if anybody had some additional thoughts before we move on. Mr. Demling. Yeah, so um, knowing that we don't control uh, final budget approval um, and that, you know, the, 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 the more that we reduce the level of cuts, the less likely it is that, um, that it will be approved by our member towns. Um, I, I would like to see what, what do these cuts look like at an 800 level, at a 600 level, at a 400 level. Right, basically, and it's a, another way to ask this is, um, you know, with a, is is a look at that cut list. What what comes back if you get two hundred thousand back? What comes back if you get four hundred thousand? What comes back if you get, you know, um, so that when people are advocating uh, for, you know, for example, if they want a, a larger school budget, well, what does that mean in terms of practicality? Um, you know, and in terms of like, you know, which budget cuts are these the right cuts? Um, you know, I, I, I would want to kind of hear, um, uh, I, I don't feel like I fully understand the low level student impact enough to, to do that kind of comparison. So I would, I would like a little guidance and, or opinion on that. Um, it doesn't have to be tonight um, from, from the superintendent, like, like the family center outreach thing um, looks like it really stings, but maybe there is as much sting in something else that is, I'm not understanding the wording of um, or your description. Um, so those are the two things I would be looking for that would help me uh, navigate this process. I, I, I like those uh, two suggestions. I think those are helpful. I would second that. Ms. Seeger. Yeah, I really like those suggestions as well. I'm wondering too, with along with that, um, in terms of the cuts, what that looks like in terms of assessment as well, um, so that we can see the impact on each town and like see whether or not we feel it's reasonable. Any other um, follow-up comments that folks would like to add or request? Mr. Demlin. Sorry, uh, I don't mean to blow this scope up, but are we doing capital tonight? Oh, yes. So uh, I wonder if we should regroup. It's 9.08. Uh, I'm not suggesting we don't do capital, but we, you know, Ms. Stewart is, is watching the meeting and, and uh, maybe we should review the agenda and see what can be pushed till next week and, and what we feel like we need to do tonight. Um, I don't know if, if now is an appropriate time to, to do that. Um, I defer to the chair on that, but I think, I yeah. think there, there's some things we probably can push to next week and some things we probably can't. Yeah. 
why don't we um, look at this since uh, Ms. Stewart is in the wings, I think that that makes sense to continue with tonight. Um, are there, I'm, um, I, I don't know that there's any time urgency for us to talk about capital tonight. Um, so I don't know if that's one that we could push to next week. I, I think that'd be fine if we're going to talk about budget next week anyway, then we can, you know, have a, a briefer conversation given some of the requests that were made and then, and then focus on capital as long as mm -hmm. Ms. Dr. Slaughter feels comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, the in-person planning update, you know, is going to be a big topic next week. I can do that very briefly tonight. I think I can, if people are, I give a brief update knowing that a longer one's coming next week. Uh, I think, I think I can roll through that actually in like five minutes or less. That's um, um, so I think we can, we can, that can be a quick one. Okay. Um, I do feel like, uh, the, the other two, um, the vaccine resolution and the 2021, 2022 year, if we can tackle those tonight, and I think so. the rest of the committee is, is amenable to that. I do think those are important for tonight. I'm seeing a few nodding heads. Okay, we'll move on. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Ms. Stewart. Um, so our next item is athletics uh, fall to shoulder season and winter sports update. Okay, well, turn Ms. Ms. Stewart, just for context, I know you're watching the last little bit. So uh, I think uh, brevity is our friend tonight. Um, and I think if you can, you know, the slides were in the packet and I think we can maybe just summarize the, go through them summarized and then see if there are questions. Um, you know, and while Ms. Stewart's bringing up the slides, I'll just mention that uh, we're looking at the fall two season uh, and Ms. Stewart's gonna bring forward information. Uh, we have been in touch with the health director for the town of Amherst. Uh, Ms. Dragon is supportive of all of these um, recommendations you're gonna hear from Ms. Stewart tonight. Um, we would be asking for a vote as we are vote as we are still in remote uh, to move forward with um, the floating season or fall to I like floating it sounds better than fall to because it's not fall so I don't understand how it's fall to but that's just me uh, but I'll pass it over to Miss Stewart to share um, the brief slides that she put together thank you for bearing with us Miss Stewart I know it's late yeah no worries thanks for having me again guys um, so tonight I'm just going to talk about the winter review a little bit. Uh, you guys will see the pictures right here. You don't see any swim pictures because we did not offer it this winter. We are planning to offer it in fall, the floating season. I like to say floating season because everyone keeps thinking I'm pushing it back to next fall. <laughs> so it's a little confusing to the community. Uh, we have 19 more days remaining of this winter season and then we start up the floating season on March 1st. So these are the sports we're looking to offer, football, um, indoor track, um, and swimming. So I just put indoor track in quotes with my hands because it's more gonna be like a training opportunity. There are no sites that are available that are offering um, rental space for indoor track. So it'll most likely be um, dependent on the weather, uh, outdoor track workouts outside, as well as some strength and conditioning workouts. This spring season, these are the sports that we were still looking to offer, but we will talk about that at another meeting. So as far as indoor track goes, masks need to be worn at all times. Uh, that's gonna be the same throughout all the sports other than swimming. Uh, sanitize all equipment before and after use. They do not recommend using any starting blocks um, and then just making sure that anyone that's handling the equipment also wears gloves if it's coaches or any other game um, helpers at that point in time. A lot of the events also have specific um, guidelines that we have to follow, such as what lane we should be in, stagger starts, which we saw in cross country and in Nordic skiing. And um, like I said before, I don't know if we're gonna get to these events. There may be a couple meets at the end outside. However, we may just go right into the track, regular outdoor track season. So it's not really like an indoor track and field season. Football. Masks need to be worn at all times. The sidelines have changed. There's going to, going to be, they're gonna expand the boxes to be 10 yards uh, longer. There's gonna be uh, social distancing on the sidelines during practices. This is a big one that there's only 30 minutes of contact a week. If we have games, if we don't have games, it's 45 minutes. 
um, of contact, which is max 15 minutes per day. Uh, we have to sanitize all equipment like balls, mats, anything that we use, huddles, everyone should be facing the same directions at timeouts and timeouts have also been extended to, for two minutes um, just to make sure everyone has time to go grab their water and it eliminates the squirting. If you remember, you know, people would just squirt Gatorade bottles um, through the helmets. It just gives everyone time to go grab your water bottle and then virtual film sessions as well to eliminate classroom time. Swimming, we spoke about this in the winter, so all of the same modifications stay uh, true. Virtual meets, uh, exiting the pool, not using um, the locker room, so exiting the pool after you finish your um, set, and then on the opposite side, someone bringing down the masks and then putting it right back on after afterwards. And then also no cheering on the pool deck just to eliminate any of that, and that's pretty <laughs> much. Mr. Stewart, oh. if I could jump in, just an update on the pool. I talked to Mr. Roy Clark yesterday. Uh, we probably, the pool won't be ready probably the first week of this, but he's aiming with the uh, the company that's doing the fixes in the pool for the second week in March. Um, so this, the, this season is probably maybe a slightly shorter for our swim team uh, based on the fixes to the pool, but he felt confident, like very confident by the third week in March would be fixed, but he, he thinks the second week is is a reasonable timeline with the consultants coming in to fix the sand filter and then refill the pool and, and get it up and running for the team. So just a, a quick update on the swim piece because uh, I knew we were having this meeting and Mr. Roy Clark and I met yesterday about it. Thank you. Yep, and so they'll also be using the cafeteria a little bit for any of their dry land activities. So this is what has been recommended. Um, football, indoor track, uh, workouts, I guess I should really say, not to get everyone confused, and then swimming uh, virtual meets, that also means. So there are some schools that didn't participate in swimming in the winter. Those are who we're gonna be competing against uh, virtually in fall too. So that is all I have for you guys tonight. I know that was super quick, but I can take any questions. Questions? I have a, a, a little question. Um, you mentioned that the, the swim team will be doing its dry lands in the cafeteria, not not in the weight room. Yeah, so they can do some in the weight room too, but they've been doing like, in the beginning, they were doing some in the cafeteria. It's a bigger, it's a larger space and they can do a lot of body weight workouts, um, which our coaches thought that was better for them and preferred by most of the student athletes, actually, the body weight workouts. Dr. Morris? Just uh, while we're moving this along, just in the packet, there was also from Dr. Slaughter, uh, a reduced fee structure for the shorter season. Um, and so just, it was an acknowledgement that the season is, the, the, the duration is, is less than what it would typically would be. And we want to prorate the cost to students and families uh, to accommodate for that or to re represent that. So um, as you get perhaps towards a vote in the next couple of minutes, um, however you vote, it just, you know, if, if the committee was comfortable voting on, you know, moving forward with athletics, however you choose in floating season, but if there's an affirmative vote, also the fee schedule as, as described in the, uh, in the packet, which just, again, just prorates it a bit. And we feel like that's the fair thing to do for our students and families. Thank you. Any questions? Not seeing any. Um, so I will make a motion that we approve the uh, floating season uh, sports, football, indoor track, and swimming as presented by Ms. Stewart. Second. Second. Moved by McDonald and second by Stancer. And we'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord? Forgive me. <clears throat> what are we voting on? Uh, the uh, sports, uh, the floating season sports, football, indoor track, and swimming. Thank you. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. 
Spitzer, aye. Miss Stancer. Stancer, aye. Ann McDonald, aye. And I will further make a motion that we approve the athletics fees as proposed by Dr. Slaughter. Second. <laughs> Moved by McDonald, second and by Stancer. And another roll call vote, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Dancer? Dancer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Both motions passed unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, Ms. Stewart, who is doing an incredible job managing athletics program during a pandemic, which is not necessarily what she signed up for, um, <laughs> but uh, incredible work. And, and I received just today uh, another incredibly uh, kind email about her work from uh, a parent in our district. A parent, I don't, I don't know very, you know, personally very well, uh, but just how much it's made a difference for their children, and just how much confidence they have in Miss Stewart's work and all the safety protocols she's put in place. So, very much want to publicly appreciate all the work you do, um, and thank you for what you're doing. It's making a huge impact on our students. So, thanks, Victoria. Can I just make one shout out publicly to the coaches? I mean, the coaches have been doing a great job too, so I couldn't do any of that stuff without them. So if any of them are watching this, I bet Coach Ehorn's watching this to see if football gets approved, but thank you to the coaches for all the work. Um, but yeah, have a good night and hopefully you guys are done soon. <laughs> great, so we'll move on now to um, the brief in-person planning update. Yep, and I want to let uh, Dr. Good. I was messaging Dr. Slaughter that I was hoping he was going to. We got a Pelham hearing on Thursday night, so not a lot of dull moments in Dr. Slaughter's life these days. Um, so I'm going to bring up a very brief slideshow. It, it's really just the preliminary data of responses at the regional level. Um, so here we go. And can folks see that? Okay. So um, at the middle school, so we gave the survey out and it was uh, due uh, recently. And then we, we just today put out an email for uh, folks who, who have yet responded. So we expect these numbers to go up in terms of total responses. Uh, we've also had some people who have changed their minds after they filled out the survey. So this is really where we were as of this morning. Um, so at the middle school, there were 67 responses from staff. The question was, will we respond, will volunteer to return to in-person instruction roughly on March 1st? There were 54 who said they would not, 13 who volunteered to return. Eight of those were support staff. I'm intentionally being slightly vague because I don't want any of this to be identifiable. We, we value the confidentiality of the process that we promised. And five were teachers um, in the middle school. At the high school, we had 109 responses, 93 to not return, 16 volunteered to return in person, 10 were support staff, and six were um, teaching staff. Summit Academy, there were three responses, two not to return, one to return. And the comment section, I, I thought it was worth putting in uh, the themes. Um, we did uh, some qualitative uh, analysis of the themes. Um, there was a comment section that was uh, Voluntary, it wasn't, um, or optional, it wasn't required. Um, but the things that we uh, that came out for the for the staff members who didn't want to return frequently were um, desire to wait for vaccination, family responsibilities. So if they have children in their home in remote learning settings, they couldn't commit to coming in in person until they knew that their kids would also be in person. So that was a concern. Some safety concerns for themselves or family. They may have filled out or they may have received. Um, because of health concerns, um, again, sort of a, a remote assignment for this year. Um, not only, that's not the only group in that category, but that came out. Uh, there were some programmatic concerns. There was a lot of concerns of what the program would look like if not everyone returned and whether students would have to change teachers. Um, so there's a lot of concerns about, you know, what, it would, what a partial return would look like. And then there were some concerns about whether returning would be against the union. I really want to note that the the because uh, I don't want this to be misinterpreted. Uh, our experience, me, um, Doreen Cunningham, and and Jenna Ortiz worked with two members of the executive board of the APA. was was a hundred percent collaborative um, from the beginning. We had a joint email address. We were answering questions collaboratively. Um, so I, I know that these concerns were expressed in the comments section. 
Um, I do want to publicly state that the association and their work with the administration was very supportive. Um, we worked well together. We had a session that was supposed to take three hours, took an hour and a half because we were able to get a lot of work done collaboratively. Um, and, you know, I do believe that there was uh, no, you know, I have no evidence that there was any um, pressure that was being put on. I think it just, you know, it, it's an unusual situation. Um, but I don't want anyone to believe that the, the union was sending any negative message about participation in the survey or participation and willingness to return. Um, they were really supportive of the process and great partners, frankly, uh, in the process. So that's where we are. We'll come back next week with more thoughts about uh, what is possible, given, um, given the responses that we received. Um, and that is what was intended to be a quick update for tonight. I see a question from Ms. Lord. Yes, thank you for that update. I'm curious, um, like at the high school, 109 responded in terms of what percentage of all the employees. Is that like 75%? Is it 25%? Yeah, it's a great question. I don't have that at the top of my head, but it's, it's definitely the majority, a significant majority of the staff. Um, and, and more coming in and some people just you know it got it got lost in their inbox it happens to the, everybody um so uh, we uh, debbie Smolin did some outreach today um just trying to get more responses but it, it's the vast majority yeah thank you Ms. spitzer um thank you very much for the um update you mentioned that some people are changing their responses i can assume given what's going on in our town specifically at umass with the rapid rise in cases that it's probably going in one direction and that for those who haven't responded yet this can't um i don't know i'm, I'm just feeling like the what's happening locally is going to have an impact on this and it's really unfortunate the timing um so am i right in my assumption that those folks who are changing their responses might be shifting in that direction like with the numbers i think at the same ratio as the overall responses there were some that went the other way you know, I mean, some of this is just, it's life stuff, right? If you have a kid and you're not sure your kid's going to go back to school, you may not be able to make that decision. Um, and then people are evolving and, and people, it, it, this was a really, I want to, you know, compliment staff for taking this really seriously. The comments were, were, you know, when you put an optional comment bar, sometimes you're like, yeah, I'm not sure anyone's really going to fill this out. And this was not that scenario. Um, so, um, I think this was a really, really difficult decision for people. And I think anytime in life when there's this difficult decisions, all of us go back and forth an awful lot of times. And so the UMass thing certainly could have been part of it, but some of it was just um, that people really struggled. There were a lot of, I mean, reports of a lot of tears because um, this was such a hard decision for many of our staff members. So, you know, I think the UMass thing was more recent, but people were filling it out and then changing. We had a couple people change their mind on the same day they filled out the survey. I filled out the survey an hour ago. I now want to change my mind, right? So I don't, you know, I don't think we haven't had a wave of people change their mind since the UMass situation has occurred. I think it's, I'm not saying there's none, but I think it's a really personal decision. Uh, and it's really, it's not easy. It's, 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 um, there's a lot of factors, you know, and I mentioned some of the highlights. By highlights, I mean uh, factors that were cited frequently by staff, not, you know, not judging any of them. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, the evidence I saw and when the changes were happening, I, I think it's, uh, I don't think UMass was the predominant factor for the majority of people. I'm not saying it wasn't a factor for some, but, but I think it's... Um, you know, I feel for staff, none of this is easy for anyone, committee members, the community, for staff members. And I think that was reflected in how seriously people took the survey. Uh, you know, I, I also think, you know, I'll just say in another one of my districts, there was also a lot of interest in perhaps returning when the weather's a little warmer and it can be outside. You know, that's a little different than at the regional level. And I'll leave it there and don't ask me any questions about it because this is not a meeting of elementary committee. But since I'm not an elected official, I get to say those things. So I think, you know, people really were thoughtful and detailed in terms of their feedback um, and decision making. Um, and, it's you know, it's a really I'm telling things, telling you things you already know. It's a really hard situation. And I think the, the survey, the comments in particular reflected that. All right. Um, Mr. Demling. Yeah, uh, you know, first thing I just want to say, generally speaking, that um, 
you know, I, I will echo your appreciation for the APA Executive Board's uh, collaboration in this process. The um, the survey email with with all the information and the way it was was phrased, um, it was real a real testament to that. I I, I think, and um, you know, I also want to just state, you know, that when we talked about this idea initially, um, and we've mentioned this multiple times, but I don't think it could be said enough, is that you know, the school committee is very clear. We honor and respect however a teacher approaches this process. If you if you decided not to fill it out, if you filled it out and went one way, if you filled it out and went another way, you know, like, eat, honor and respect all of those, those options. And regardless of what numbers we may or may not have been hoping for, you know, um, that, with the, I, that, you know, for me, that feeling persists. I just, I just, Maybe I'm saying that awkwardly, but I feel like it, it needs to be said re repeatedly, uh, particularly from our from our vantage point. Um, you know, one, one small I won't get into like the pra practical uh, implementation details really until next week. But um, one thing I was curious about um, in terms of um, you know life situation for younger children uh, of staff who would be of school age. Um, do is there is there a possibility of of guaranteeing staff a spot at a daycare or a distance learning center? Um, in order to to accommodate that, if if someone is out of their home and they're teaching in person and they need a, a place for their their school aged uh, child to to go, so at this point that would take a further expansion of our programming um, or the programming that our partners have put in. I should be more clear on that one. Um, you know, they did just expand, and we prioritized at that point families for whom their children's attendance at school was was the most problematic. Um, so, you know, it's definitely something we could look at, but I also think there was an interest in not just childcare, but in some of the responses of, of people, their kids being in school, you know, um, I think just for some, it might feel awkward that, you know, they're going to teach while their children are going in to be in a remote learning center instead of be taught by a teacher doing what they're doing. So I think there was a little bit of cognitive dissonance in there. Uh, I can imagine two people got in touch with me privately and shared some of the cognitive dissonance aspects of that. Um, so, you know, I think it, it might work for some people, but I, I also think, you know, like everything else in this, it's complicated. There's no other sort of clarifying questions, so they'll um, move the further discussion on this to our uh, joint meeting next week. We'll spend more time on this topic. Okay. Um, next up is our Vaccine Educators Timeline Advocacy. Um, and this was, we've, we've talked about this, about um, prioritizing um, educators and staff um, in the state vaccination plan. And I know that um, Ms. Spitzer took the lead on sort of drafting um, a resolution for us to review this evening. And I don't know if she worked with anybody else in the committee on that, but um, thank you for doing that. So should I... Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm happy to. Let me. I'm not used to. Um, Where did folks have a chance to read it um, this afternoon? Yeah, so it's um, all right. more for sharing for the viewers. Let me know if you can. Can everybody see? Yep. The document. Okay, so this is slightly changed. And so let me give you a, just a tiny bit of background. Um, so um, Chair McDonald reached out to me and said, I think you have an interest in this. Here is um, what Hadley just passed. Um, I think it might be a good model. I, I agreed. And um, and Bethany also reached out and, and gave it a read to and we, we both agreed that it seemed like a, a good option made some minor edits. Um, then I guess it was, it was only yesterday. <laughs> Time's funny these days. Anyways, but um, but then the, the town council got in touch um, and said, you know, we also want to um, pass a resolution. And they had drafted a letter that was a bit, totally different format, but had similar similar sentiment. So um, they, um, they actually ended up preferring this resolution model. And so they took this resolution model and then made some minor edits. So what I'd like to do is just call your attention to what those edits are. Um, there was a hope that I think that our resolution would be as close as possible to to the one um, that the, um, the town council ended up passing. So um, after I sent it out, it was 
in the language around phases and groups. So I created a clean version here, but it really was in this whereas statement here where they changed the statement. So it now says the Massachusetts Department of Public Health is currently planning a COVID-19 vaccination plan that has teachers prioritized in group three of phase two for which group one of phase two began. So it was just clarifying um, this language with this specific statement of the groups and the phases. Um, and then continues, this paragraph was also updated. Let it therefore be resolved that the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee calls to the state legislature, the governor and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health to include all certificated and classified school personnel in group two of phase two, clarifying move them up from group three for access to a COVID vaccine as soon as it becomes available. So I think the earlier statement had been a little more aggressive in terms of moving them up into um, the same phasing even it could have been interpreted as healthcare workers, which given that that phase, it, I guess they're rolling. So it's not like phase one has stopped, but it's um, it's been offered, at least from my understanding to most, almost everyone in phase one has had an opportunity to be vaccinated. Um, and so we're now actively in group one of phase two. And so this is asking not to move them ahead of people who are 75 and older, but to put them right after those folks. And, and my understanding, and um, again, I'm not as on this, is that I prefer to have the Department of Public Health clarify this, but, but that it would be bringing them back in line with what was originally announced as um, Governor Baker's plan for vaccination. Because if folks remember, they were originally um, higher up in group two, but then um, Governor Baker moved people 65 and up higher up in the priority in this group, um, group two. So those are the changes. Otherwise, it's essentially the same document that was circulated to the to the group. Um, so I'd welcome any more feedback. But given, um, you know, the desirability of having our statements be as similar as possible to the counts, town council statement, I'd kind of move more towards, you know, if, if folks like this and um, to kind of approving it for, for that reason. So, but I'll stop talking and let people comment. I'll keep it up though, if, if people would like to. Thanks, Ms. Stamser. Um, I just, I have one uh, little nitpicky thing. Can you scroll back up a little bit further, Carrie? Um, there was a place where every place you're using group and a numeral, but there's one place where you didn't do that. And it, it to me, it made it confusing to read. Mm, where was that? Oh, and in the paragraph, uh, planning a COVID-19 vaccination plan that is teachers prioritized in group three of phase two for which group one of phase two can you change that group one to be consistent with all the others? I'm sorry, it's nitpicky, but I, yeah. It's fine. Reading this over, I was deciding whether or not we should go to Roman numerals for the phases, since that seems to be the standard elsewhere, but I decided <laughs> I share your sentiment, Margaret. So is that how you'd like it to read? I can also capitalize G to make it consistent. Yes, I, I think that's good. Mr. Demling. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Spitzer, for your work on this. I, I know it can be very difficult to merge resolutions from a different board, um, past experience. So thank you for your legwork on that. Um, big thanks to the town council for passing this last night. Um, this is the advocacy we need. Um, big thanks to Senator Comerford, in particular, uh, Representative Dome. I'm sure Representative Blay also um, is involved in this, but I've, I've followed Representative uh, Dome's um, work on this. Uh, and she really, calls out exactly what's going uh, on wrong with the Baker plan. Um, you know, this, this shifting priorities is one very confusing aspect. Um, uh, I, th I think she calls the overall Baker vaccine plan uh, sluggish and significantly flawed. You know, if you think of the vaccine line as this massive queue, how soon you get a vaccine is partly a function of where you, you are in that queue, but it's also a function of how fast that queue is moving, right? And, and the Baker administration has just done, in my opinion, a terrible job. Of, of distributing the vaccines that we do have. Now, of course, this is all fruit of the poison Trump tree, and we should have had the stockpiles of vaccines, and you know nobody disputes that. Um, but we are where we're at. And um, I appreciate the improvements that 
uh, Representative Dome has been able to make in terms of pace recently. She's continuing on that, and this complements that uh, really well. So I'm, I'm happy to vote in support of this tonight. Other comments or questions? Ms. Seeger. You're muted. I can't unmute tonight. What is that? Um, <laughs> I reached out to Ms. Spitzer because I wanted to bring this to the Leverett School Committee too, which I'll do in the coming weeks. And I, I just, I appreciate her putting this together or finding this and updating it. Um, I've just been personally really um, dumbfounded how we have a state who says reopen the school, but then they're putting the teachers in a different, like in a lower category for, for vaccination. So I've just been kind of struck how that is. And I'm really glad that we're putting this together and. Um, I really hope that this administration starts to get this, as in the state administration, starts to get the message. So thank you, Ms. Spitzer. If there's no other um, comments or questions, um, are we ready to move to a vote on this? blank stare so I'll, 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 I'll make a motion I, uh, <laughs> I um, move that we um, approve and uh, sign off on the resolution as presented and as with the minor edits as discussed second moved by Mac, uh, McDonald and seconded by uh, Seeger sorry I almost forgot my own name um, Mr. Demling Demling aye Mr. Harrington Harrington aye Ms. Kenny Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, um, Ms. Spitzer, for all your work on that. No problem. Should I um, email this to S Sasha? Okay. Yeah. She might just need a little context of, um, but not much. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So um, our next item is 2021-2022 uh, school year discussion. Um, and as a, as a little bit of context for those of you, um, for our non-Amherst members, we, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, we had the um, open meeting of residents, um, the Amherst School Committee, sorry, um, hosted this meeting um, on Thursday of last week. And um, a repeated question that we got um, both before in submitted comments beforehand, as well as during the meeting was, was really asking about what is the prospects for um, in-person uh, learning in 2020 in, in the fall. Um, and I think you know, Dr. Morris also mentioned the, the number of school choice exploration, if not applications coming from our district um, into other districts. Um, and so understanding that and, and knowing that context that a lot of parents are really eager and anxious to understand sooner rather than later what the picture is, you know, what school will look like for us um, in 2021, 2022. That's why we wanted to bring this forward as a discussion for this evening. Um, and Mr. Demling shared a motion um, that I have up on my screen if you would like me to share it, Mr. Demling. Yeah, that would be great. Um, while you're bringing that up, do you want me to just uh, give a little yeah. intro? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so like Ms. McDonald said, um, uh, you know, we had that meeting last Thursday. And um, so, I know it's late, so I won't, I won't say all about um, what I think about this um, this prospect now. Um, but uh, you know, I'll first just kind of read it, and then for, first of all, the 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 we're this is um, on the agenda for discussion. So the idea is, uh, if we have interest, uh, we could bring it back uh, next week if if we're meeting next Tuesday, which I believe yeah we are. Uh, we have a meeting scheduled next Tuesday. Um, we could bring it back then for um, a potential vote. Um, so so the motion is, you know, I'll, I'll just read the whole thing because it's pretty simple. Provided that a COVID-19 vaccine has been made available to all staff and the safety guidelines of local public health officials are fully adhered to, the Amherst Regional Public Schools will provide full-time in-person learning for the full 2021-2022 school year for all students. 
The superintendent will manage this plan and any shift back to remote learning based on a continuous assessment of health conditions in direct consultation with local public health officials. So um, just, just a couple of things. So why, why now? Um, uh, you know, my, my feeling is that uh, we're, we're at a major inflection point with, with regards to how many people may potentially leave the district. Um, you know, we, we have the quantitative enrollment that we've all seen about the, you know, the, the, the equivalent to 10 year enrollment drop. Um, and, and, you know, and then we have all the qualitative input we've had over many months of public comment and last Thursday. Uh, and, and we mentioned earlier, you know, the budget pain of that, whether that's chapter 70 or choice or, or charter and how much that could affect if, it, if it's much higher than, than anticipated. Um, and, you know, we're at a point in the calendar where the, although some of those institutions, the private schools, um, the choice uh, programs for our neighboring districts, all of which have had more in person than we have had, uh, and, and the charter schools as well, the, those recruiting and application seasons are about to kick into high gear. And, um, you know, this is the time when parents start making those decisions. And I think particularly about the charter schools, um, because it's, it is the high, the most economic pain for us, um, that we, we kind of dodged a bullet this year in terms of uh, those schools being remote. Um, and we, we can't anticipate that happening again. And so we could be in a, a much more severe situation. Um, you know, a couple of the things that this motion kind of implies, uh, one is that um, we're not gonna have the budget to offer a fully remote learning experience for any student in any grade who wants it next year. Um, it would be awesome if we did, right? That give us your learning mode and we will fund it. Um, but I think especially given the budget discussion we've just had uh, and the guidance we've received from our member towns, it's, it's good to be realistic and direct with the public that, that we don't have the resources to run a parallel um, virtual school system where, where we're looking at a million dollars worth of cuts. And you know, finally, um, you know, one thing that's intentionally not in here are our metrics. Obviously there's been a ton of and continues to be a ton of discussion and interest in, in metrics. And I kind of feel like the, the approach here on principle is that the school committee really ought to be focused on deciding what the district should be doing. And so clearly laying out and signaling to the superintendent for the public, you know, what, what will happen in the fall, how that's done should be left to administration. And with regards to how that's managed, you know, the core reinforcement here that, and we followed this, this, this principle with the volunteer plan is we should follow the science and, and defer to the guidance of local public health officials as, as much as possible um, without having to call out detailed metrics. And, you know, I, I think back to our discussions last August and, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll admit I was one of those members in August that was that was keen on our honing in on and defining a specific metric or, or bag of metrics um, and, and giving those to the superintendent. And I think uh, in retrospect, that that it, it was not the the most effective approach. Um, I, I mean, it was a common uh, approach, um, but I, I think the, the lesson learned for me is that you know the qualitative assessment of health professionals and and having the district leadership uh, lean on that is 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 what we ought to be doing. So you know, it's 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 an opportunity to kind of signal to the public this is what we're doing going forward. Um, so I'll, I'll just pause there and um, you know see how see what people think. Comments or questions? Ms. Spitzer. I guess I'm just um, looking for some clarity around the term full-time and trying to understand, does that mean we're moving? Um, so we've had two things happen this year. One is that if, if things had gone well with the metrics, we would have been um, having some of our students in a hybrid model where they would be kind of having a few days a week in, a few days a week home, I think. And then we also have, um, for even those who are gonna be in five days a week, we had an, a, an abbreviated day to give staff, I think, time for the extra cleaning involved, for the extra PD development, the extra work that was involved in um, teaching during the pandemic. So does that encapsulate getting rid of all of those options? Um, or not options like it's late <laughs> forgive me i'm just trying to get clarity about what what your intent was with that language and also just check in with the superintendent if he also reads it that way and, and make sure we're in agreement understanding on that term mr Demley. 
So yeah, um, the short answer is yes. The 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 intention of um, full time is that all of your learning time would be in person. So there's not a defined hybrid model, um, and um, you know, and it's 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 intentionally paired with provided the safety guidelines of local public health officials are fully adhered to, right? So even with the vaccines coming and 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 whatnot, we don't we don't exactly know, right, what the status of the virus is going to be in September and December and, and a year and a half from now. You know? um, and so uh, it would be foolhardy to say, regardless of what happens in the future, this is what the model will be. Uh, and so if if the local public health official guidance is, um, you know, you shouldn't be having more than X number of people in a space, even after all adults are, are vaccinated or even after everyone and even after the ACH, even after masks and even if community spread is assessed, you know, then then this will have to be reassessed. So it is it is conditional on that. Um, but yeah, and, and it is I'm glad you brought it up because it is it is a make it is a big decision. Right. And it's it's it. But it's it's um, it's it's one I propose that we consider um, um, so that we don't take a number of months um uh you know leaving it out there of you know you say you're going back but are you really going back how many days a week are you going back and what are you really committed to um and you know it's it, it's i i feel like what we need to do especially given all of the uncertainty of what's gone over this year is that we need to be very clear about what our intentions are um and if if we feel that it's realistic and possible again with the caveat of safety guidelines of public health officials that we should be we should be marching towards that um that goal um i i as well would like to hear what dr morris thinks about implementation you know although it's perhaps way too early to ask those kind of questions but um but yeah I hope, ho hopefully that answers your, your question about the language i can speak briefly to the implementation yeah. i think that my mind goes at this level in in february 9th to uh, what we need to do in the short term. And for me, that really relates to thinking about, because it's a regional meeting, what the schedules might look like at the secondary level. Um, thinking about um, courses, because I, I don't want to make assumptions about students and vaccines. You know, I feel very confident, you know, regardless of the success of um, the statement that you voted tonight about where educators and vaccines, I, I feel very confident, you know, that there will be a timeline that's pre September where they'll be accessible um, to adults. So, you know, I think a lot about, you know, what schedules do we want to have? How do we limit the number of sections? So our old, you know, seven drop one schedule seems like, you know, at least for next year, not talking about a permanent change, we would want to think about what that looks like. Um, that's probably not in the best public health interest, even, even if everyone was vaccinated in the school. Um, you know, it's unlikely that COVID will truly be eradicated on September, whatever, or August, whatever, that we come back. So in the short term, I go to thinking about things like that, because we do need to sort out the schedule sooner, because of course, election um, and things. So, you know, I think, you know, at our high school level, do we want to move to a block, which would which would significantly limit the number of students, uh, student, or student, multiple cohorts of students? Uh, that interact on a daily basis, as well as the number of students who see an individual teacher for, for everybody's health and safety. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that we're working on as a team, you know, separate from even this particular motion that, that was raised tonight was, you know, assuming we are in person, how do we put in place the things months before? Because we can't change the schedule in the summer. We did that last year. We don't want to redo that again, right? It wasn't... It, people did a great job. It's not a model we want to emulate. So at the high school level in particular, where course selection is much more open than middle school, just developmentally where kids are and how many electives there are, we need to have a schedule that's reliable, dependable, like in the next couple of weeks uh, so that students can register for classes. So for me, uh, those are the types of things around implementation that are in my head. There's certainly uh, uh, many, many other details that will have to be worked out in time. Um, many of those we have time to work out the schedule we just don't you know you know in the next month we need to have a schedule and we need kids registering so we need to figure out what our courses are and frankly going back to our budget conversation where where budget kits might happen um so that's where my mind is on this right now um in terms of a lot of other logistics we'd have to sort through 
that that would be the work between you know now and really into the spring and summer uh but like the winter conversation is really focused on what's the best schedule for our the safety of our staff and students uh given a, a, a perhaps negative assumption that covid isn't eradicated negative i mean you know pessimistic um what would we do to maintain uh, as best as possible student and staff safety and for me my mind goes right to schedule and we're in the thick of it right now so to paraphrase in another way it would be helpful for you to have this direction from the school committee in the near future <laughs> Um, direction about next year for sure, you know, yeah. and, and we're going to go on assumption because we have to, uh, that we're not all virtual all year next year. I don't think that's, you know, I'm not hearing that from the school committee, whether this motion or passes or not. I certainly have not been hearing a desire for that from the committee. Um, so if there is that desire, you know, let me know really soon because this schedule stuff really does need to um, sort out very quickly. So I'm not very articulate this late. Ms. Stancer. So, I, I, can you just, I guess I'm still a little bit confused. Um, what, it, is this going to preclude students who might not be comfortable coming back into school in the fall? Um, will there still be an opportunity for virtual if students are not comfortable coming back, if we do this? Mr. Demling. So, again, I, I probably have to defer to Dr. Morris for exceptions cases. Um, we have, you know, thousands of students. Um, are, are there situations where, where where students have have are really significantly at risk? You know, immunocompromised is is, is one situation I'm thinking of where um, where where we may be able to set up a custom program on a, a for a, a limited number of of students for to access remote learning during a pandemic, um, even if everybody else is fully in time, is that possible? That, so that's a question I would have asked Dr. Morris. I, th I think though the the hard decision that we need to um, confront here though is that is um, constructing fully in person and a hybrid model at the same time and staffing it does does not seem to be financially feasible, you know, in terms of staffing and. Um, uh, I, I, I think that's correct. Um, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear maybe from Dr. Slaughter or, or Dr. Morris about that. But when we think about w what we're designing and cause if you say like, Hey, if you're not comfortable, you can be remote. That could be across any grade, across any class, across any building, across any service. And so you have to staff for that. Right. And that, that adds a huge expense. Um, and we are going in the opposite way for budget. Um, so again, you know, I'd, I'd be interested to hear confirmation of that from from Dr. Morris. Um, but but yeah, this would be a a a a very strong commitment that that we are going back in the fall and that we're not hedging our bets. Um, we are accepting the budget reality, um, and we are accepting that that in a in a post vaccine world where all of our 16 plus year olds have had the opportunity to be vaccinated staff and students um and and if we're following all the local safety guidelines um that we should be in person um and you know that's uh it would be more declarative um but but i, I you know for the reasons i stated earlier is that's 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 the motivation you know is because i feel like right now is, is is what we need uh dr morris and then miss stancer again yeah so just very briefly um to mr demling's point uh running parallel systems uh, we talked earlier about some people wanting us to be efficient. Um, that's the high point of inefficiency. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it or should do it, but if you're asking me if we can definitely afford it, mm -hmm. I can't give you an affirmative yes. It's going to depend on the right number of students taking the right number of courses, the right number of staff members who want to be virtual. You know, at the elementary level, that's a little harder to... Sorry, we're not talking elementary tonight. No, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> Second time. Uh, it's a little easier for me to conceptualize at the regional level, given the course sequence. It's a little harder for me to conceptualize uh, how we could do that within the confines of budget. Um, 
if everything worked out perfectly in terms of course selection and the right number of students, the right number of staff, yes. But um, I'm not seeing a lot of flexibility from our earlier conversation about budget where we can just casually add staff. We do have federal funds coming and that's really for PPE and COVID related expenses. Um, I know some districts have publicly already stated like they're not doing any virtual next year. I'm not at that place of making like a, a broad statement like that. I know some districts did that this uh, last week. Um, but it may, it, it likely won't look like it looks like this year. Um, unless there's something that I'm missing or, or the world perfectly aligns. Uh, I don't know how we can run parallel systems and still do school. Um, and, and again, we're not a poorly funded district. We're having a really hard time at the moment, but, um, you know, it's hard to imagine exactly how that could take place with choose two parallel tracks. Ms. Stancer and then Ms. Spitzer. Okay. I just, so, uh, Mr. Demling, you just said something that's not written here, which is that assuming that all staff and students 16 and over have had shots, you don't have students in here. So maybe that should be added. Mr. Demling. So uh, this is a discussion, right? So we can bring up, bring any additions. Um, so I, I, I said 16 plus because I, I, and someone else can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that the major vaccines right now are approved for 16 plus. There are trials that are, I think, 12 to 15 uh, currently going on, and they expect that later this year. We don't know exactly when those will be available. Uh, I have not heard about trials for less than 12. Um, so it, in my opinion, it seems like the writing's on the wall that everybody who is 16 and older who wants a vaccine will will have had the opportunity to get one by the time next year starts. Um, I, you know, we could certainly put that that in the in the motion. I think it's and, and this would really require digging into the weeds. I think it's less sure that age 12 to 15 is going to be fully vaccinated by September 1st, um, and even less likely less than that. Um, but so this is more for like staff, right? So like, um, because that is such an issue as we saw in the survey for uh, staff comfort and, and coming back. Dr. Morris. Very briefly, I know it's late. So I just think, I think I heard a distinction in Ms. Dancer, unless I misheard you and what you said and what's written that, that wasn't highlighted, which is the, what I'm reading in the draft motion is had been made available to staff. Uh, what I thought I heard you say is that everyone has vaccinated. And that assumes that everyone who has the opportunity to be vaccinated chooses to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different conversation. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to preclude or push that conversation, but I just want to note that uh, major institutions, and Ms. Spitzer has talked about this, um, uh, that one would assume that everyone, one, someone like me would assume that everyone gets vaccinated, um, have not seen that bear out. Um, so I just think in terms of the language of the motion, that'd be different than the language here. And I, know, I don't think it's wise for us to talk about mandating vaccines or stuff, because I think that'll probably happen at the state level and all that. But I just wanted to note the distinction. I noted, and that was not my intention. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Spitzer? Sorry, um, just one more kind of logistical question. I know you're focusing mostly on schedules, but I feel like there's this other issue that's really big, which is space. And um, in I have no idea what the recommendation will be in the future around social distancing and vaccinated populations. Like if that's something that's gonna stick around in the fall or, or not, but if it were to stick around and maybe it's the six feet variety, maybe it's the three foot variety that we were so strongly opposed to in the fall. But um, if we were to vote on this, would you be able to make that work and for the six feet or for the three feet because that, that's just my biggest concern with um with moving forward on this um, I, I i just want to state my support for this generally i'm just trying to get into the weeds a little because i feel like it is it is a big deal i want to make sure i understand um where we are at um and i'm sorry it's late i'll try to no it's all good. so I, I am thinking of the you know the spacing too i just since i don't know what the guidance will be it's impossible for me to answer clearly i think what we know is that not everyone can fit at six feet in the current time um some of the schools more than others um three feet is not wildly different than fitting people in the way we would do it 
in a normal time, it, it would be a different arrangement. But in terms of how many kids fit in the space, it would it would it would not be a wildly different number than in our normal systems, um, just a different configuration. So, you know, that's guidance that we'll wait and see on what comes from it is the way I would say I'm not committing to I You all can commit to whatever you like. I mean, I, I think waiting and seeing on the space piece makes sense this far out. But Mr. I defer to Mr. Demling or other yeah. people on that one. Mr. Demling. Yeah, so I mean, Ms. Spitzer brings up a great point, point. Um, and yeah, I, you know, when I, th I think back to our original discussion, we came out the day that the state guidance came out, we, we, we uh, where they said six feet if possible, but three feet as, is minimally acceptable. We came out and said, no, six feet is. And I remember, you know, at least for, um, for my part, I, the reason I felt so passionately about it is that it was so out of step with the recommendations from other public health officials, right? Um, what 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 will the recommendations of public health officials be with regards to distancing this fall in a post-vaccinated world um uh and in a post-research world right we have so much more research about effectiveness of ach and masks and and, and other um uh safeguards um and, and to to you know to be able to determine and, and you know transmission in school and 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 youth and whatnot um so, you know, so that's that's why that that conditional of um, provided the safety guide not guidelines are fully adhered to. Clearly, if there's a safety guideline that prevents us from having everybody in person um, at the same time, uh, then then this this motion can't be implemented. Right. And 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 Dr. Morse will have to come back to us and say, you know, you gave me a conditional that doesn't achieve the goal. And then and we'll have that conversation. Um, but I feel like I feel like we need to set the goal. And then say without getting into here are the 19 which would be an interesting conversation but I, I just think not great for us as school committee members to jump into here are here are the 19 conditionals that ought to ought to happen at that point right it's it's um i've, I've I just personally and this is just my own personal you know take is I've, I've really come around to um that the way these things should be managed should be this, this qualitative assessment by local public health officials who then consult with 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 the head of the organization, the you know, superintendent Morris, um, who, who then is, is making those determinations of, of of back and forth. So, so that's where I come down on that. I did want to ask Mr. Dr. Morris, just if you could just briefly clarify the schedule thing. So it, if you could just tell me if this is what you're thinking, that the when you say block schedule, you mean like four you're seeing four classes a day, and so a staff member or a student is with four groups of students versus the old seven drop one where you have six cohorts of students. Um, and so you are reducing your number of cohorts by 50%. Therefore, it is safer because you're reducing your daily exposure. Is that the, yeah, um, if, that's, if, that's, that's, if that's what you're describing, that certainly seems like the advisable thing to proceed with exploring. Yeah, so that's a good summary of it. And, you know, we're, we're in a modified block schedule as Ms. Gripko knows this year. Um, and, um, you know, it's this isn't a long term commitment to that. I think that will be an open question in the future. Um, but at the current time, uh, you know, just from a health and safety perspective, reducing the number of cohorts makes a lot of sense. The seven, the seven drop one, it's, it's actually seven cohorts of students. It's only six gets, six gets seen in a day and then you have a drop one. So in terms of contact tracing and exposure, both for students and staff, it's it's about I, I'll just it's not advisable in my opinion. And that's the feedback we've received from public health officials that you want to reduce the number of cohorts that students interact with on a regular basis. Um, and from a staff perspective, it gives um, a significantly lower number of cohorts, you know, so just you just think about contagion, right? So if, if there are issues, you're you're building in the kind of um, context uh, to reduce transmission instead of um, schedules that increase the likelihood um, that problems would, would arise uh, and grow. So yeah, it's it's purely health and safety. I think there's a lot of educational arguments that have gone on for the last 20 years across the country about schedules, the high school and block schedule. Uh, that's not actually where I'm coming from, uh, where our team is. It's really just about health and safety. Thanks. If there's... um. Because it, it's getting now super, super late. If there's no more sort of clarifying, um, understanding questions, we are coming back to this next week. Um, so there will be opportunity for 
any further discussion that we might want to have after having had a week to sort of marinate on this one. So are there any urgent questions on this motion right now? Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Downing for working on that. Um, and last but not least, we have um, warrant report. I don't know, Ms. Spitzer, if you have any warrants to report to me. I just have one. I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $151,972.32 for the warrant dated February 5th, 2021. General fund, this included general fund expenses of $144,077.12, revolving fund expenses of $1,625.05, grant fund expenses of $5,983.15, and other funds in the amount of $287. I send this on February 5th. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, our last regular item is accepting gifts, and I don't believe we have any gifts tonight. Nope. Okay. Um, so I will now move that we adjourn the Regional School Committee at 10, 10 p.m. Is there a second? Second. I going to say, come on. <laughs> After four hours, there's no, uh, no discussion on uh, that motion, um, so we'll move to a uh, roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Emily I. Mr. Harrington. Harrington. Ms. Kenny. Kenny I. Ms. Lord. Lord I. Ms. Seeger. Seeger I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer I. Ms. Stancer. Stancer I. And McDonald I. So we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for sticking with us for so long.